Okay. We're going to call the meeting of the April 15, 2019, Mojave County Board of Supervisors to order. If you would please rise. I have asked Supervisor Gould to lead us in the invocation and Supervisor Bishop to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'll please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this day that you've given us, Lord, and we thank you for this great nation, Lord. Lord, we ask that you watch over our county employees as they're out going through their work day. Many of them work in potentially dangerous situations, and we just ask that you keep them safe and bring them home safely to the loving arms of their family, Lord. Watch over our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines, Lord, our border patrol and our coast guard. Um, watch over each and every one inhabitant of this uh, earth, Lord, they're all your children. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Please join me in showing respect to our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. I need a motion to call for an executive session to be held on May 6th at 9 a.m. for discussion and consultation with legal counsel in accordance with ARS 38-43103. So moved. Second. No in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Motion in action to approve waiving the reading in full of items presented for discussion, adoption, or approval at this meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Official business to come before this board. Number one is discussion possible action to receive an update and obtain legal advice from the county attorney's office regarding pending or contemplated liability claims and related legal actions involving Mojave County. We had an executive session um, to hear our um, legal claims and there will be no action taken, I believe. No action is necessary. No action necessary. Okay. Number two, are there any committee and or legislative reports? Um, Supervisor Watson. Nothing this morning. Okay. Supervisor Gould. Uh, nothing this morning, Madam Chairman. Supervisor Bishop. Um, other than the legislative liaison duties, uh, I attended the uh, Mojave County Board of Health and was selected as their president for this year, and vice, vice chair was Mayor Cal Sheely of Lake Havasu City. <coughs> okay. Thank you. How about Supervisor Johnson? Thank you, Madam Chair. I attended a class on the Las Vegas shooting. It was put on by our risk management and our Mojave County Health Department. Um, it, it really stressed the aftercare that's involved. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of money that's going. This is still ongoing at this time. It'll be ongoing. They're projecting for a three-year period. Uh, it's something that our department's going to look into because it's something we probably haven't thought about on a mass casualty of the size of that. That's all, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. There are no meeting minutes to approve today, so we'll go on to the call to public. Those wishing to address the board at the call, yes, what? Uh, report. Oh, well, there yeah. usually isn't one, so I guess I just, <laughs> just, is there a county manager's report? Madam Chairman, no report today, <laughs> and it's at your discretion if you want to call on me, of course. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, call to public. Those wishing to address the board, I'm opening up the call to public. Those wishing to address the board at the call to the public regarding matters not on the board agenda must fill out and submit to the clerk a call to the public request to speak form located in the back of the room prior to the meeting. At the conclusion of an open call to the public, individual members of the public body may respond to criticisms made by those who have addressed the public body, may ask staff to review a matter, or may ask that a matter be put on the future agenda. However, members of the public body shall not discuss or take legal action on matters raised during an open call to the public unless the matters are properly noticed for discussion and legal action. This morning we'll start with um, Trent Pike. Please give your name and address for the record, please. My name is Trent Pike, and I am the owner of uh, the Cattle House Restaurant at 5091 Highway 95 in Fort Mojave, Arizona, which I think you guys are pretty much aware of this restaurant by now. I've been complaining about the missing plans at my restaurant for over three years with your management department. Um, and what I've found is nothing had been done about my complaints. I had to hire a lawyer in regards to these missing plans, these revised plans that your architect or that my architect 
had provided to your building department that were signed off, they came up missing. I asked for help with this. Uh, nothing had been done. The only thing that was done was abuse of power tactics, people calling the ROC on me that work for the county. Abuse of power tactics of people coming after me with the sheriff's department that work for the county. People using these missing plans. When I, called, when I hired my lawyer, I asked Mike Hendricks to speak to my lawyer. Mike Hendricks told my lawyer that he found these missing plans. So I hired a new architect for these missing plans. When I hired my new architect, Mike Hendricks had a chief building inspector run with this architect and lie to this architect about my missing plans. It got to the point to where these plans, I, w I was going, you guys went to the sheriff's department about these missing plans. Tried to get me arrested about these missing plans. The, I don't know what is going on with Mojave County you guys opened up a favoritism investigation when you couldn't get me arrested. Hilde Angus, I went to you a year and a half before this favoritism investigation, and I asked you for help about these missing plans. You did nothing. But you allowed for a favoritism investigation to be opened up on me and my family? This was all brought to my attention in a meeting with Ron Gould and Mike Hendricks just recently on the 25th of February. I requested all my public information a year ago about this situation, and I just received it Friday. I'm sorry, last year, the end of last year, I requested this information. I just received it Friday. And you withheld it in your office, Mr. Hendricks, for over a month before, you received, before I received it. It took you and Mr. Walsh two months to give me my missing plans on disk. How is this behavior accepted? Seriously, people, what are we going to do, man? I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. How are we ever going to make Mojave County great again with this type of management? Tell me that. I'm done. Thank you. Um, would you like to respond to the criticism? We respond at the, respond at, the conclu at the conclusion. Oh, at the end. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, um, next up is Linda Hollins. My name is Linda Hollins, uh, 4825 North Mormon Flat Road. I'm here in support of the cactus cleaners um, because of someone putting in a complaint. Uh, I have, in my mind, you have the county has pulled all support for the cactus cleaners. Uh, my question is. They have abated over 300 tons of trash out of Mojave County. Um, I would like to know if the county could come back and tell me that they could have abated that much trash because what I'm understanding is uh, it goes to the race. A race looks at it. Hopefully he can find somebody that can clean the trash up and for them to pay for it. And if they can't, it just sits and rots. Now, I guess I have some other ideas of why if one person has made a complaint, how can one person put a snag of the whole county, which has give him several documents of appreciation, and now you've cut him off at the knees and he can't go out and pick up the trash. And um, I believe in, in 19, or 20, 2017 there was one arrest for trash pickup. Uh, in 18 there was 43, I believe. I'm not quite sure if that's the right number. My question is, what's the big difference? Why from 1 to 17? Well, my, my idea is because of my husband going on Facebook and starting this group and has over 800 people on this group trying to keep the desert clean here and you're cutting him off at the knees? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is William Terwilliger. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. You 
got it pretty close. Oh. My name is William Terwilliger. I live at uh, 17932 Mesquite Road in Dolan Springs. Uh, good morning. Uh, I've lived in Dolan Springs for about six years. My wife and I are both veterans, and when we retired, we chose Mojave County to be our forever home. We made this choice in part due to the natural beauty and many outdoor activities that we could get involved with here, including trail riding, hiking, prospecting, and sightseeing. While enjoying these activities, one of the few downfalls we experienced was the amount of trash we found. Roads and trail sides, open desert land, both public and private, in the washes and in the mountains. We found all kinds of trash, tires, abandoned boats, marring this beautiful scenery. We always brought out more than we brought in, but it never seemed enough uh, to me, and our impact was minimal in correcting this is issue. Then in the beginning of January 2018, I had the good fortune to meet Wayne Hollins and learn about the Golden uh, Valley Cactus Cleaners and their organized efforts at cleaning our deserts. With the invaluable assistance of Mr. Hollins and Todd Davidson of the Mojave County Erase Program, I founded the Dolan Springs Cactus Cleaners. And we completed our first cleanup of public lands in our area by the end of that first month. Uh, since then, we have uh, cleaned up over 42,000 pounds of trash, 800 tires, boats, and over 100 pallets. While not on par with the efforts of our Golden Valley friends, I don't think we did too bad for our first year, and we're making an impact. We are making an impact. We're small but dedicated. We use all of our own vehicles, fuel, trailers, tools, and supplies. We're not funded by any other organization, including Mojave County. With the exception of several small generous gifts from our community, we pay for everything out of our own pockets. The county support we received was in the form of manifests and landfill passes provided by a race, and it was greatly appreciated. Now this county support has been severely curtailed due to issues that I will not go into, but I'm sure everyone on the board is aware of. I stand before you today to let you know that we will continue our efforts with or without your, uh, the support that has, in my opinion, been unjustly diminished and roadblocked. I have two suggestions for the Board of Supervisors' consideration. One, attempt to implement a multi-agency task force on county trash issues, including investigation and, if warranted, the prosecution of those that are breaking our existing laws. I understand that this task force was discussed several years ago but never got off the ground. It should be revisited. Two, pursue the possibility of starting an erase version of the Sheriff's Posse program. This would take some of the strain off an already overworked erase team by having a few trained individuals throughout the county perform initial investigation of illegal dump sites. This would include taking photos, determining land ownership of the dump site, and forwarding the information to a race or the appropriate agency for action. They could also locally issue landfill passes once a race has opened a case and determined that the dump site is within the scope of the county's program. This would be total voluntary program with no cost to the county other than training. In, the, in addition to myself, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you, you just have about a minute left. Okay, Or I'm 30 fine. seconds. In addition to myself, many of the other cactus cleaners here are veterans. And we veterans are a stubborn bunch. In the midst of changing conditions, we're trained to change our tactics to meet the new challenges and get this job done. This is just what we intend to do. We'd pre we would prefer to have it as much, uh, or as much support from the county as possible, but with or without it, we will get the job done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up next is Mr. Wayne Hollins. My name is Wayne Holland, 4825 North Mormon Flat Road, Golden Valley. <clears throat> in 2015, as you all know, we started the, the cactus cleaners and have been cleaning up. We've cleaned up to include tires, about 800,000 pounds of trash and tires out of mostly Golden Valley, but some in, in uh, Kingman area also. <clears throat> it cost the county about $15,000 over a four-year period to support this program. Not much money. And then a couple years ago, we had come up for the uh, support the sheriff with a quarter percent tax increase for the county. That was voted down, thanks to Supervisor Johnson. Uh, and now, he wants a $6 million substation and have a few which already have have one may need some upgrade and whatever but there's a building golden valley have none dolan springs have none you want six million dollars i want five thousand dollars a year 
to help support cleaning up the desert, which helps everybody in the county by not only looking, make it more enjoyable to go out there and, and do the recreation with, within the county. It looks better, improve property value, and comparatively cost the county pennies. So I, I, I appreciate all your support, especially Supervisor Watson and Supervisor Bishop. Uh, they've pretty much been with us since day one. In 17, we had a meeting to discuss cleaning up the desert and what we could do to, to help stop the illegal dumping. Last year, I called to have another meeting to see how, how that affected us. What, what were the statistics since then when we started? So far, we haven't had a meeting. I think now it's time to discuss that, plus add how we can continue on this program that we, we started. And I just think that would be a good idea if we can see what improvements we made and what more we can do. And again, I, I appreciate all the support. Todd Davison of ERAs, Colin Patillo, the environmental engineer, and the supervisors who support us, and of course all the people that uh, are out there helping us clean up the uh, desert out there, and all the people who support us, not only in Mojave County, but in California and Nevada. So it's not just what we're doing here. A lot of people appreciate what we're doing and have taken up their time to, to help us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a, a letter that was sent to, and I believe each su supervisor has it, and it will go into the record. You want to read it? Thank you, Chairman okay. Angus. Um, yes, last night I received a very well-written page-and-a-half letter from Mark Sheminsky. Uh, I hope I came close to that pronunciation, but Mark has been uh, Wayne Hollis's uh, most active volunteer, uh, along with Mr. Mr. Glenn sitting in the front row there, but uh, he really spelled out exactly uh, what the cactus cleaners have done in the few years that he's been a volunteer, what they would like to see done, and uh, he's very supportive of uh, looking at the task force again that we, we looked at a couple of years ago, and I'm very supportive of that too. So I just wanted to let Mark know that every supervisor has a copy of the letter and uh, we'll be digesting that a little more closely uh, later on in the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Also, I, I hear and I see that there is several people that are in support of Cactus Cleaner. If you'd like to stand up now uh, so we can gauge and see. And Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's all I have signed up, but if anybody still would like to come down and say something, I will permit it. Anyone? Okay, I'm going to call to uh, close the call to public. Um, any anyone want to respond to anything that was said? Um, Madam Chairman, um, regarding uh, uh, Mr. Pike's presentation to the board on the call to the public, I'm sorry, on the uh, uh, request for information, I. I don't uh, manage that. I don't look at that. I don't uh, address it. I don't control it. But the request that we received was uh, a request for a Herculean task to pull together a, a ton of information. And I want to thank my staff for doing a great job. I believe they performed as best as they possibly could in uh, and development services in, in getting the information together uh, for Mr. Pike. And we did it as timely as we possibly could. Uh, I didn't uh, withhold any information uh, regarding the issue of uh, something getting turned over to the sheriff's office. I don't believe anything was ever turned over to the sheriff's office regarding Mr. Pike. Um, on uh, uh, the plans that uh, he discussed, I believe uh, we made clear at, at the meeting with Supervisor Gould that um, I thought we came to terms on what had been received and what needed to be received, and I pledge uh, to the board that we'll continue to try to assist Mr. Pike in any way we can to get him across the finish line, but we will not waive requirements or close our eyes on 
the regulations on what he needs to provide to get approvals for his project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, oh, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to respond to uh, a couple of issues that the uh, that was mentioned during the um, cactus cleaners uh, call to the public. So um, the the county did not pull all support from the cactus cleaners. I just wanted to to verify that uh, we did not do that, and uh, and we may have tightened up some some uh, some of our procedures, but we certainly have not pulled our support from the cactus cleaners. Uh, as long as it's on public property and, and the erase program will go forward with that. So, Mr. Hendricks, if you can go into that a little further for me. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's very, very uh, simply put that uh, we appreciate everything that uh, the Cactus Cleaners ha has done and you, you provide a tremendous service. And if I would have thought Earlier, I'd have been one of the people that was standing up in support of you all. And Wayne, you do a fantastic job, and I, it's very much appreciated. Regarding what the county uh, position me, was. Uh, excuse me, Ryan, are, are you, we allowed to talk about this like this? Or, or can we just put it on the next agenda? May I? May I well, I'm, I'm asking I Ryan if we're allowed I, to do I this. Finish. We can respond to criticism. It specifically says here, at the conclusion of the open call to the public, individual members of the public body may respond to criticism made by those who have addressed the public body, may ask, review, may ask staff to review a matter, and may ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. So right. we can put this it to a future agenda. We can ask the staff to review it, or we can address it. I would just ask that we put it, let's finalize this and finalize the, criti the response and move forward with this. And, I, and very clearly, um, the only position that the county has taken so far is uh, to no longer issue dump vouchers for uh, waste or tires that's it, the possession of a private individual on private property. Um, that's, that's the only action we, we uh, have uh, issued. Uh, we still uh, will continue to issue dump vouchers for wildcat dumping out in the desert and for cleanups that weren't under the ownership or control of an individual. I hope that clarifies. Okay, well, again, I think there's a lot of misinformation. Do you, would you like to put it on the future agenda, uh, Supervisor Bishop, since it's your district primarily? Um, we can talk about that. I, I would like to put something on a future agenda about uh, the task force that we talked okay. about before, and, right. and that would encompass that discussion as well. Okay, thank you very much. Next up, we have a presentation this morning by, and again, I'm probably gonna get this name wrong, Mr. Vianney Celatino of the U.S. Census Bureau regarding the Complete Count Committee for the 2020 U.S. Census, um, something that you're gonna be hearing a lot about this year into next. Thank you, good morning. Thank you for allowing us some time today to talk a little bit about census and what is coming up. Uh, my name is Vianney Celestino and I'm a partnership specialist with the Census Bureau for the Denver region, which uh, is 12 states, including Arizona. Um, I wanna start by uh, saying the census is important. It is mandated by the Constitution on Article 1, Section 2. It is also important um, regarding um, apportionment, draw, uh, distribution of federal funds, and informing the community and federal, tribal, and state and local government about communities. Uh, it is important also to note that uh, based on census information, we either gain, maintain, or lose uh, seats in the Congress. Uh, so, uh, so 2010, Arizona gained a seat on the Congress, and we're expecting to gain another seat in 2020. So that's why we are um, working really hard to get an accurate and fair count, count in Arizona. Uh, what is also important to mention is that we estimated by, that by every person that we miss in Arizona, we're losing around $2,000 per person. And this is just for one year. We gotta keep in mind that the numbers that we get in 2020, we keep those numbers for 10 years. So one person, $2,000, it's, it's a lot of money for funds that we need for uh, communities, for the state, for the counties, for the different um, towns. 
Uh, another important point about census is it's safe. Uh, all the information that we collect is protected by the U.S. Uh, code, Title 13. We don't share any information with any, any other agency. Records are confidential for 72 years by law. And also we, census employees, take a note to protect information. We only uh, report uh, information on statistical format only. Census, this, um, um, this annual is easier than ever. It's the first time that we're gonna be able to respond online by telephone and the, the, the form, the paper form. In 2010, we only had the form. So um, by telephone and online, we're gonna have 12 languages, including Spanish, for people to respond. So it's gonna be easier than ever to, to respond census. Um, so what we are um, asking Mojave County today is to create what we call a complete count committee. And basically what a complete count committee is, it's as, as, and as, as a committee established by local governments and community leaders or organizations to help the census to increase awareness and um, motivate responses. Uh, the CCCs are census ambassadors um, in the community and, and play a very important role for the 2020 census. We are looking for the trusted voices in the community, uh, in your community and your county, to let people know that we need to get counted. Uh, we have different structures for complete count committees. You, you, you have people, internal people, but also you can invite people from your community on probably workforce, workforce and development, faith-based community, education, media, community organizations, it's totally up to you. Um, the Complete Count Committee is totally managed by your county in this case. The U.S. Census uh, representatives were just here to support you, to give you the information. Uh, basically what we do is we conduct a, a two-hour training with the, with the members of the committee. The committee will start working on an outreach plan and they'll take it from there. When? Uh, the formation of the CCCs is happening now. As of right now, we have around 39 complete count communities throughout the state. Uh, all of the um, counties in Northern Arizona have already uh, can, uh, get the training except by uh, the Mojave County, so we're here. Um, to help you to get the training um, done as soon as possible. Uh, we really want this community to have an accurate and fair count. You want, we, want, we, need the, we want to make sure you get the representations and the funds that you deserve, that your community deserves. Um, and just, uh, just to finish my presentation, I just want to go over some operations updates. Uh, we're going to have six um, area census offices in Arizona. Three of them are gonna be located in Maricopa County, one in Tucson, uh, one in uh, Blackstaff, and one in Window Rock. Uh, the one that is already open is the one in Maricopa Central. Uh, the address is 3106, um, I'm sorry, 3111 North Central Avenue. And that's the office that is gonna be overseeing the address canvassing operation, which is gonna take place this fall. During the address canvassing operation, we're gonna check addresses. 30% uh, we're expecting to um, canvas 30% of the country. Uh, and basically what it is is that we compare our database information, what, what we got from the different counties and cities um, in 2018, and then we're comparing those, that information and when we have any discrepancies or doubts, we go and check. So we're gonna be conducting that um, uh, operation again um, this fall, and, and, and it's just in preparation for the 2020 census. 20, 20, we're gonna go live on 20, 2020 census on March 23rd. People can respond as of March 23rd. However, the uh, official census date is April 1st. Um, we're gonna have here are the addresses for the two offices here in Northern Arizona, Flagstaff and Window Rock. Um, Blackstaff 3105, uh, 2400 North Walgreens Boulevard, and when the rock is the Navajo Nation Fairgrounds, Arizona 268th Street, Michaels, Arizona. Uh, we're hiring, and uh, that's another thing that complete count committees are helping us with. 
Uh, we're gonna be, we're, we're hiring a person, a partnership specialist um, that is gonna be based here in Northern Arizona. Uh, so we're posting a job for that person probably on Monday, so we need help. We need someone that knows your community, someone that lives in the area and will help us to work with complete count communities in Northern Arizona. So uh, we're posting soon. That position is gonna be in usajobs.gov. And also the other um, venue that we have for hiring, and this is for address canvassers and in 2020 enumerators, is at 2020census.gov slash jobs. So that's what I have for now. Do you have any questions? Okay, anyone? Supervisor Watson? <clears throat> yes, I do. <clears throat> Sir. You're indicating a complete count of everyone residing in Arizona, correct? Yes, sir. Does that include people that are li not living here legally? We, uh, this is a census of population. We Pardon count me? everyone in Arizona, living in Arizona. Everyone living in Arizona, everyone whether living they're in Arizona. legal or not, is that correct? Every, well, this is a census, again, of population. So we're just counting people in Arizona that reside in Arizona. It doesn't matter what status they have. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that there is a Supreme Court um, case about that that's being heard now. It hasn't been decided. It is a question. It's a question. Um, the, the trial is on if we either we're going to have the citizenship question on the questionnaire if you're a citizen of the United States or not. Okay. But it doesn't mean that if you are or not citizen, you, right. you can't respond or not. It's just a question. Right. And um, <coughs> we don't have an answer yet. Uh, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it's going gonna, it's gonna to be soon because we need to go to print in June. Uh, so, uh, but we don't know yet, as of right now, if the question is going to be there. But again, you know, we can't, everybody that lives in, in the US, uh, and, and it is important because Every person that we don't count, you don't get those funds back to your community. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Wool? No? Supervisor Bishop? Um, I have a question about um, people in our county that are homeless that don't have a physical address to live. Is, is there a way to count those folks? Yeah, we have different operation, and then you know that we go through all this information on the training. We have different operations for homeless and um, group quarters. Um, where like military bases, students um, living on campus, uh, people that live in mental institutions, that kind of stuff. So it's a different process. It's not like self-response, uh, like telephone and, and um, um, internet and form. Yeah, it's a different operation, but yeah, we count them. Okay, and then is, is there a way to count uh, <coughs> residents who live off the grid that really don't want to be counted? Are, are you taking that into consideration? <laughs> well, what we're trying to do, that's what we, we, we're forming these complete count committees. You know your community better than us, so you're going to help us to try as much as we can to, for people to self-respond. After a period of time, if they don't respond, we're going to send enumerators to the streets. We're going to start knocking on the doors and trying to do face-to-face -face responses. After that, if we don't get a response, we need to do proxy. We, need to, we start talking to neighbors or um, the male person and, and just do proxies. We, we try to do as best as we can. That's why it's important for us to educate the community in advance so they know the importance of the census, what's coming up, that is safe, that is easy, and, and the importance. Good, okay. Well, I'm looking forward to it because in a lot of the <coughs> communities in my district, there's um, a lot of discussion about what their population is. So it'd be yeah, nice to really it's know very those important. numbers. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Supervisor Johnson. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a, a, a federal um, program. And now you're getting down asking the cities and the counties and the state to kick in millions of dollars to do the Fed's job. So what you're saying is the federal government hasn't been doing a correct census all these years? No, we're trying to do it as better as possible. We, every, every decennial, because I were 2010 um, uh, census as well, we tried to get better and better and do it better. It's our job and that's why we're here. Uh, <laughs> what we're trying to, it's just partnering with you. Because at the end, this is a benefit of your community. You're getting the funds back. 
based on your population. So if we get an, a, a complete and accurate con, you're gonna get your federal funds back to your community. And we're partnering with you just to educate communities so they know what is coming, what to expect, what is the importance, and how to respond. <coughs> but, but our governor's already, I think, put in the budget if they've got it through yet. We're $2 working. million dollars to do it. Now you're asking the cities and the counties to do it. Uh, you, you throw out a number of every person we count Extra is two thousand dollars. What is that? Two thousand. It means it means basically that if we don't count a people, one person, and this is based on the main sixteen federal um, programs, such as WIC, Title Title Eight, uh, those kind of programs. So the George Washington University made a study on those, and it's calculated that if for one uh, fiscal year, if we don't get the, if we don't get that people count, one person is two thousand dollars of money that is going back to your community. Okay, and, and I don't mean to pick on you. I'm just it's no, not it's okay. The program, but <laughs> but you're looking at Mojave County, which has two hundred and twelve thousand people. Right, say. correct. Okay, if we counted and we said, okay, we've got two hundred and thirty-seven thousand people, two hundred and fifty thousand people, mm -hmm. the monies we get are not going to go up. I mean, because the money you're talking about is federal money for CDBG grants and those things. It's a minimal amount of money. Mm -hmm. Like Lake Havasu City, they wanted to be over 50,000 so they could, it gives them a, another step. If they go to 60,000, I don't think it gives them enough money to make it worth their while to do all this. I, I just think that, you know, we're, we're wasting money on things that a small county like ours is not going to make a difference. That's all. Thank you. It had nothing to do with you, ma'am. Thank you. Well, okay. again, you know, we're here to we're here to support you in, in any way you can. So okay. I, I, I want to expound a little on what Supervisor Johnson said. We were told that the state has already put it in the budget to give money towards this because we have an agenda item later asking mm -hmm. the county to they give have a bill. They have a couple of bills on on yeah. Well, and I think it's just in the budget. They they're doing it administratively, but okay. Um, but the when uh, I was back in Washington last month, and mm -hmm. this was a big topic of discussion. And they did say that the federal government is going to be giving a lot of money to local, to more rural counties, um, to those who need it. Do you know anything about that? I don't. In, the, in 2010, we had, to, you mean to support census? Yes. Uh, in 2010, we had the stimulus money. Uh, we don't have that this decennial as of right now. Things might change. But in the past, what we were forming complete count committees, we were giving money to the complete count committees for, to help to support the committee. Uh, as of right now, we don't we don't have those funds. We don't we don't have those funds, and we're not asking you to put money on your budget. What we're asking is just to um, use the resources that you have, you, your your communication uh, platforms, uh, your leaders, just to tell people what's going on. We're not asking uh, uh, communities to put uh, you know, allocate budget for that. It's that's totally up to you. Okay, I'm on a complete count committee for Bullhead City, and I see uh, City Manager Toby Cotty here. I think he'll speak about it. Um, and I think you're right. A lot of it is informational, getting people who are influential in your communities to just talk about it. Um, but there are promotional things, and I'm hoping that the, fe the federal government will supply a lot of that stuff, uh, and then it will be just up to the counties whether they choose to spend the money to, you know, for, for promotion in that regard, and that's what we'll be talking about. But I just want to reiterate something that you just touched upon, and that's how many jobs are available um, in the whole county and the cities, and they're pretty good paying jobs. Um, so there will be a website, and I'm sure we'll put it up on our website, uh, for people who want to make some money um, for a temporary job, and uh, uh, there'll be a lot of opportunities. Yeah, and we're, we're hiring for both the Flagstaff and Window Rock. I know it's kind of for uh, um, jobs, but also we're going to have uh, field jobs. Right, I'm talking about the local field jobs. Field I'm jobs, not, yeah. I'm not talking about really jobs good. where people would have to go to Flagstaff. I'm talking local Mojave County jobs. We're hiring left and right. We're hiring a lot of people. Okay. Yes. I think uh, Mike Hendricks wants to say something. And I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Ms. Silatino, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Uh, very, very uh, generous of you to come and um, explore this with us. If we decide to go with a correct count committee, if the board decides, uh, when does the count start and when should we have uh, the committee on board and up and running? Um, again, you know, we're, we're, we're 
forming complete count committees right now. Um, I work mainly in Maricopa County. That's why we're hiring a person that it's in, in, the, in the community here in Northern Arizona. Uh, and I'm just gonna talk about what I, what I know. In, we have formed all the, the 20, 27 municipalities have formed already their complete count communities. We also formed the complete count community with Maricopa County and we also the, the governor just uh, signed executive order to form the um, state. Uh, complete count committee. So we're forming right now. Uh, this is the time because it takes, we gotta do the training and after that we need to start, the community needs to start working on the outreach plan. Whatever you're gonna be doing, just participating on events or uh, discussing your challenges and your opportunities and who's gonna do what. Um, we're gonna start um, the actual um, call to action per se is gonna start on January 2020. We go live with the census on uh, March 23rd, 2020, but the actual uh, um, official census day is April 1st. And then it takes a month. We're gonna give people a month to self-response, and if they don't self-respond, then we'll send people to the street to do um, knocking in the doors. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Ma'am, do you know what kind of questions are going to be on the census form? Um, I've received in the past the long form census, um, which I did not fill out. Um, <laughs> I told the, the federal government, which is all they're entitled to by the, the U.S. Constitution, mm -hmm. the number of adults that were in that household and the number of children that were in that household, which is all they're entitled to. Um, I refused to tell them how many toilets I had, how much money I make, how many cars I have. So will we see those kind of invasive questions again? No, that's a different survey. This is a, this, this is a decennial census probably. What you got was the American survey. And there's a sample that we do throughout the years. This is, this is a, the census we conducted only ten, every 10 years. And it's as of right now, it's only 10 questions. And it's very basic questions. And the most important question for us, since again, is it, it's a population uh, survey, is how many people live in this household. Um, Madam Chairman, ma'am, I beg to differ. Um, I distinctly remember in the 2000 census that those invasive questions were asked. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the census, it was not, not just a questionnaire. And it actually told me that I was under uh, penalty of law to fill that form out and that I would be, uh, men with guns would come to my house and take me away in chains if I did not fill that form out. <laughs> And I, I personally, I think that that's the reason a lot of people don't participate willingly in the census is because the government wants to ask questions that they have no right to know. The purpose of the census is to enumerate the population for the apportionment of representation right. in the House of Representatives. Right. That's, why we, that's why we count the folks. So I'm going to be disappointed if I see a forum come out with invasive questions on it. It's and I have a hard time convincing my constituents to, f to answer those questions when I myself will not answer those questions. I understand. Um, it's, uh, as of right now, it's only 10 questions, and it was almost the same questions in 2010. You're gonna have a, we're gonna have a proof of the, you're gonna be able to see the actual form before uh, the actual um, census, so you can see what other questions are, but it's basically name, uh, age, um, and, and, and race, ethnicity, that's it. It's only 10 questions. Only 10 questions, and again, the most important question for us is how many people live in this household? Thank you. So um, just to clarify, so if you just put those questions, you, you know, how many people and your name, not, well, whatever, and you don't answer all of them, people with guns aren't gonna come to your house. I just don't wanna get people Nobody's scared. coming to your house unless, <laughs> unless you don't respond how many people lives in the household. Right. That's the most important But they won't come with guns if you don't respond. <laughs> No. Okay, I just, Actually, I just don't want Madam to freak Chairman, out on constituents. As you can see, I don't form, have any guns. Yeah. It says you will be arrested. <laughs> really? It says by violation, if you don't fill this out, you are violating the law. And if we take that to the logical extreme, then that means eventually someone with a gun will come and take me away. <laughs> you know, just like every other law that right. we pass, that's the, if you fail to comply, mm -hmm. you know, if I fail to comply on just about any, any county ordinance, eventually someone will come and drag me away. When do you think we're gonna see those 10 questions? Uh, well, again, you know, we're, we're expecting to go to print on, on June. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping July 
we're going to be able to see the, uh, the uh, yeah, it's going to be in the full. Is it going to be public? Is everyone yeah, going to be able to see it? it's going to be public. Everything where, is going to be public. You're going to be able to see the forums. You're going to be able to see the, the online um, um, process. Um, you're going to be able to um, have it everywhere. Okay. So people get comfortable with the questions. All right. Thank and you very much. Thank, thank you, you for you. coming. And thank I you apologize. for your time. I apologize for introducing you as Mr. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, if there's no objection from the board, I'd like to move item 44 up since it's, it's pertaining to what we were just talking about while it's still fresh in our minds. Is that okay? So item 44 is, to dis is a discussion and possible action to approve the adoption of resolution 2019-039, establishing a census 2020 complete count committee for Mojave County, providing funding in the amount of 75,000 allocated from the general administration fund with all expenditures being approved by the county manager for the promotion of the best possible count of all residents. Then appoint Tim Walsh, Jean Kench, Denise Burley, and Dave Wolf as committee members, as well as five additional committee members, one appointed by each su supervisor to serve on the committee with the committee meeting monthly and reporting back to the board. Um, I do have someone who signed up for this, and that is Mr. Toby Cotter. Good morning. Good morning, supervisors. Toby Cotter. I'm the city manager in Bullhead City, 2355 Train Road. Um, you just heard a great presentation about the census, but I'm going to give you something that'll scare you a little bit more than what you just heard. So um, essentially, the reality that we face in Mojave County, Bullhead City, Lake Havasu, Kingman, is that they're not going door to door, which they did in the past. So maybe we're concerned a little bit about an overcount, and that's not my concern. My concern is a significant undercount. So the undercount equals millions and millions of dollars for our community and your county. So the reality is in March on the 12th, they're gonna mail something out to all of our residents. And that is gonna be a nice piece, postcard, letter, whatever the Census Bureau sends out and says, respond. Well, let me give you some examples of how we're responding right now in Bullhead City. So we have 10,920 eligible permanent early voters who've requested to be an early voter. 40% of them are mailing those ballots back. The fire department just did an all mail ballot where all of our active voters, our 21,000 active registered voters got a ballot in the mail to spend millions of dollars on a bond. We had a 31% response rate to an election that directly impacts their tax bill, 31%. Now imagine getting something from the US government that says, respond to the census, it's important. Are we gonna get 31%? So just let me give you some examples of what it means just to Bullhead City. Mike could tell you what your numbers are as it relates to your HERF and your state chair sales tax. So in Bullhead City, our state shared sales tax revenue equals $105.08 per person per year. $105 per person per year. Let's just say we have an undercount of 2,000 people. So let's say at the end of the day, our census comes back, Bullhead City has 38,000 people. So that's gonna cost us 210,000 the first year compounded by 10 years of this census. So we'll lose 2.1 million just in state shared sales tax. Look at our state shared income tax. It's $132.36 per resident. So we lose 264,000 with a 2,000 person undercount. These are your numbers too. Same for Havasu. So when you compound those numbers, just on a state income tax level, it's 2.6 million. So on state shared sales tax, state shared income tax, we could lose $5 million the next decade with an undercount. We need an accurate count. So we need all 40,200, our current count is 40,252 people. We need every single one of them counted. So how are we gonna do that? We need the complete count committee. We need way more than $75,000. The federal government doesn't care. And in a lot of communities in America, including one I formerly managed, really doesn't matter. When you get 95% of your revenue from property tax, the census really isn't all that important. But in Bullhead City, Kingman, Lake Havasu City, Mojave County, 
The census is really the biggest problem we have right now facing us. This is no joke, folks. It is real, it's in front of us, and what is gonna inspire people to respond back to a postcard or a letter they get from the federal government? You kind of already pointed out some of the problems in your discussion. And so it's a challenge that we really have to face, not only in my community, but throughout the county. You have a growing area just south of Bullhead City in Fort Mojave, Mojave Valley. What's your undercount gonna be there? That's money that's needed in those neighborhoods for streets and other infrastructure. So all I would say is the committee is extremely important. The money's not enough. And we can blame the state, we can blame the feds, we can do all of that. But at the end of the day, if the county count comes back in at 195,000, you will lose hundreds of millions of dollars over the next decade. That's just the reality of where we find ourselves in today. So we, the cities and the county, we need to go all in on this. We have to work together to figure this out and get everybody counted however we need to do that, however we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Cotter? <laughs> Mr. Cotter. <laughs> So what is Bullhead City going to do? You, you've gone in. Are you going to go door to door to get these people? Because that's the only way you're going to be able to do this. Yeah. So as you heard before, the Census Bureau says after they mail out their second and third and fourth letter, they're going to go knock on your door. You also heard they have six offices, none even close to here. So they're going to have a manager in Flagstaff that's going to see some data points that show a 30% undercount in Riviera and Bullhead City. We are going to have to go door to door because they're also telling us they're going to use some artificial intelligence. They're going to use other databases that may show a particular home unoccupied. They're, they're not going to do anything about it. They're going to say, no, there's no car registered at that address. Therefore, no one lives there. Not understanding that three or four people live there and they ride the bus. So we have got to get aggressive in our community. So at next year at this time, we have to be standing here saying, yes, all 40,500 people have been counted in Bullhead City. Because if we're looking at charts that show us that 38,000 have been counted, we're in trouble. So we do have to do that. I wish I could sit here and say the federal government is going to do a great job. All they're talking about is all the money they're saving on the census, how they're going to be using technology and data points to get everybody counted. The reality is that's not how it works in my community. I would agree with you that I don't think I saw something about we're going to have a street fair or something. That, well, it might sound nice and be a great idea. It's not going to get people registered. I, I went through the 20, the, the 2000 one where actually census takers were shot at in Mojave County for coming out on properties. Um, I, I think the only way you can do it is going door to door, and this that's going to be that 75,000 we're doing is not going to be worth it. We'd have to show that. Mr. Cotter threw out a lot of high numbers that we're going to lose that amount of money to find out if it's something we're willing to do. And, and will the census people even take our numbers if we give it to them? Well, we certainly have to, Supervisor Johnson, we certainly have to do our best to communicate with their workers, whether they're from Flagstaff or Window Rock. And hopefully the people they hire locally have that buy-in and have that pride and passion that we do so we're going to be talking to them every day I mean and our staff are going to have to be also involved in that because we just cannot afford an undercount and the county can't either so what does that mean standing here today I don't have all the answers certainly and we do need to meet the Census Bureau staff like we've just done but we saw it in 2010 we saw it in 2000 those are part-time jobs, and I don't know that the pride is always 100% there. It's on every street in the county, every unincorporated burg, do they really care to get everybody counted? That's a and question. I think in the 2010 one, one thing that really stood out to me was we have one city in Mojave County, Colorado City, which I would think would have an accurate count. And Colorado City had a bunch of minorities listed in that count which i know for a fact is not true and, and so that really surprised me that that happened you know in in colorado city that, sh that shouldn't have been there but i think that that's the idea if we're going to do something you've got to get them all you've got to make sure they're going to do it and i think the only way you can do it is by sending somebody to every house and that's going to cost us a ton of money um 
Madam Thank, Chair. Anything else? <coughs> That's all. Thanks, Tobin. Yes. I have a question for Mr. Cotter. <coughs> How do you distinguish uh, your permanent residence and your visitor residence? Yeah. Your, your visitors uh, are a large number of folks during those particular months that are going to be counted. Will they be counted in their home domicile, and will they respond to that, or do, how will you handle that? Yeah, so what we've learned in the past is it's really up to that person on where they are counted. Now, some people say it's where you are April 1st next year. That's what we've heard in the past. But a lot of people say, well, where I'm registered to vote or where my primary residence is. So we do lose a number of people who you know, will register in California or Minnesota or Wisconsin. That's a fact. What we have to determine, though, is if we have a particular neighborhood that shows a 30% undercount or no count at all, which we had in the 2010 census, how many of that 30% were just overlooked by the Census Bureau? How many more vacation homes, second homes? So that's a big challenge that we have. Thank you. Um, Toby, um, at our complete count committee, we were told that it is exactly where you are, April 1st, and that includes students. So if you have a, a teenager or a, a college student and they're at ASU, they have to say that they're there. They don't use this. It's, it, how I, I, I interpreted it is they don't really have the choice. It's where they are on April 1st. And I don't know if that's really um, going to be um, explained correctly in that little Coast Guard that you get. So that's just another thing that's on us to educate. But I have another question. Did Bullhead City put in money for this? And we've already had two meetings. Mm -hmm. So our proposed budget shows $200,000, and I don't think it'll be enough to do what we need to do because a lot of it is going to be staffing. We are going to need people on foot supplementing what the Census Bureau is doing. And that means, as Supervisor Johnson has suggested, we need to be at their doors. We have a 24-hour community. If the Census Bureau is working nine to five, they're not going to find these people in some cases. We have to be in the post office, at the bars, churches, casino basements. We have to be everywhere to find our people. I just don't believe, at least in our community, the Census Bureau will be that effective. So we are going to have to spend the money to make it happen. As I said, that's just the 200000 for us is one year's loss of state shared sales tax. Okay. Thank Anyone you. Anyone else? Okay, thanks. You. Thank you very much, Toby. Okay, so we're on agenda item 44. Um, is anybody would like to make a motion? Madam Chairman, just for discussion, okay. I, if Bullhead City has formed a committee and, and they've got 200,000 people or $200,000 or whatever it was, Mr. Cotter said they'd already put aside. I, I'm not sure I haven't heard much out of Lake Havasu or Kingman. They, they might be doing something. Well, it might help bullhead city to do theirs if the other ones aren't doing it you know i don't know that we can handle you know with our chump change seventy five thousand dollars too much and, and while it was nice of uh mr walsh to submit this item and then put himself on the committee you know taking away the ability of the board to decide who we wanted to put on the committee um i, I would think would be better to partner if, if the cities wanted to partner to partner with all Four, or, yeah, four cities in the county and, and then have a wide range because when you read the backup that was submitted, they don't really have, I mean, they, they mention elected officials a little, but it's more business people and those kind of people that are out there. But I, I think our people, I mean, the cities have their problems, but in the county, we got a lot of people that live out there by Supervisor Gould who don't want to be counted. <laughs> and they take a special kind of person to go talk to them. <laughs> That's all. <coughs> Madam Chair. Yes. Um, <clears throat> might I suggest that we wait until we find out what the other communities are going to do, the other cities are going to be allocating to this, to this function, because this is just the first cost involved when they start redrawing the uh, precinct lines, district lines. That's going to be another huge expense. The last uh, expert that we hired, I believe, was in the neighborhood of Hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars, I believe. Uh, Supervisor Johnson, you may remember that number. It's a large number. 
Yes, it, it, it's pretty large. Now we can do it ourselves on the on the, on the districting locally, but the, when you get the big one, it it costs us quite a bit of money. Um, Supervisor Bishop, as our liaison, CSA, can you maybe um, ask them where the state is and how much they're projecting? Because they, they said they would give rural areas more. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe we had um, the uh, budget guy from the governor's office came down here, Matt Gress, and he said that they had allocated money through the ACA, the uh, Commerce Authority, for this. And it was quite a lot. So if we can maybe, as part of that continuance, get all that information. And if we continue it, uh, Mr. Hendricks, is that going to hurt the beginning of it? Because it also part of this motion is to appoint um, people for that committee. Do you, are you ready to get started on the committee? Because you can do that without money. Um, Madam Chairman, uh, supervisors, I think uh, we threw in $70,000, $75,000 for this effort uh, to try to mirror something that Coconino County was doing. In fact, um, when I was at uh, the CSA county managers meeting, one of the things that I requested from the managers is anyone, any uh, counties that were up and running, uh, give me their contact information. Then I uh, designated development services to try to pull together as much information about this um, uh, committee as possible and uh, Coconino was the most help to us uh, I believe uh, Coconino in the city has uh, designated about a dollar per person uh, they had about 75,000 from the city 75,000 from uh, their county uh, they said that was probably not nearly enough but it, it uh, gave them some monies to start with that was my intent uh, in uh, uh, development services uh, preparing this proposal for the board to consider. Uh, we believe it's probably not going to be enough money, but at least it'll give some funding start if we do start. Regarding whether it needs to be uh, decided upon today, um, the city manager from Havasu is here. I don't believe the city of Havasu has started a committee, but the reason we invited uh, the city managers to come to this meeting was to get uh, them to start thinking about participating and partnering with the county. The city manager of uh, Colorado City is here. The city manager of Kingman uh, was going to try to attend. He had a prior engagement. And of course, uh, Toby Cotter gave an excellent presentation and justification on the need to proceed with this. I, I believe the quicker the county addresses this and uh, uh, decides one way or the other, uh, it would benefit the county to start developing this committee and get them trained. So uh, I don't believe today's a drop dead date uh, for the county to consider this, but I, I believe shortly in the near future, the county needs to seriously look uh, for all the reasons given today at moving towards a, a complete well, count committee. Um, Toby Collar was the only one to sign up to speak, but if the other city managers would like to say something Good, uh, good morning, Madam Chairman, um, members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm Jess Knutson, City Manager in Lake Havasu City. Um, Toby did a really good job echoing the importance and the real dollars that are tied to the uh, to this uh, census effort. So we see that as a, a really big deal in Havasu. We, uh, uh, we've been talking to our residents already about it. Um, our residents already, whether it's Mojave County, Lake Havasu City, we're already, already paying into the uh, sales tax. We're already paying into the gas tax. We're already paying into the income tax. This is a mechanism to bring those dollars back into our region so we can spend it on services that our, that our residents expect from us. So it is a very big deal. Um, and uh, anything the, uh, the county is going to do, we'd like to be part of those efforts. Many times you'll see cities in, in uh, Arizona that uh, want to see lower counts in other cities because that, that uh, builds up the amount of dollars that are going to come to their, to their uh, communities. But we, we don't see it that way. And, the four cities don't see it that way, and the county doesn't see it that way. We need to work together to bring as much, uh, much dollar, as many dollars into this uh, this region as possible. Uh, it assists with the uh, number of uh, representation we get at the uh, uh, in, in Congress. It, it helps us with the uh, um, state shared revenues that come back to the the city, but it also helps us with economic development efforts. So, if you want to recruit businesses to the uh, to the area, uh, we need to. Um, justification in terms of what our population is, the demographics are, so that we can use those numbers to, to court 
um, businesses uh, and jobs to the uh, area as well too. So we're very, very supportive of what the county does here. Anything we can do to, uh, to uh, support your efforts, Bullet's efforts, Kingman's efforts, Colorado City's efforts, uh, we're, uh, we're here for that. Thank you. Do you, do you um, see any, any um, advantage uh, in doing what Supervisor Johnson thinks should be done? Is like everybody working together, county, the city? I mean, maybe I see these complete counts. I mean, everyone has their own, but um, the, there's going to be a representative from each district, um, except for a couple that, well, include cities, um, and they should be on both. But I, I don't want to double do efforts. It, that doesn't make sense. Um, from our perspective, I think it makes some sense to have some type of mechanism, whether it's the, this committee or, or otherwise, and I think this is a really good idea, but some type of mechanism that's going to force conversations to occur uh, mm -hmm. throughout the county so that we can educate uh, our, our residents about the importance of the census. Okay. So if we can be part of that, that uh, mechanism, we'd love to be part of that. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, Madam uh, Chair, for me. Uh, yeah, I would, the, what I was getting at it, and I don't know if Cabot was formed theirs yet, but like Bullhead obviously has formed one, that if you're on it, and then if we form one, it seems like if, if everybody's in agreement and everybody's going to throw up all this money that needs to be formed up, and, and looking at the setup that was in the presentation, you probably didn't have it. You maybe you had the same thing that they, they get out. But they've got 20-some people, you know, that start out on one, and then they br break off to another subcommittee to do things. And, and I could see where we had one that, you know, we made an agreement with the cities. And, and set it up and then obviously the cities would be in charge of the cities because they know more about them and then it, it, some of it would overlap but I think if you don't have one structure to kind of oversee it with the money you're talking you, you know it's not going to do much good and doesn't make much sense for me to put somebody on from Havasu if they have their own. Okay. I, I might have to have a question yes. for Jeff. Uh, has the city of Lake Havasu City indicated a uh, dollar sum that they'd be willing to Put in we, this effort. we haven't uh, in Havasu. We haven't uh, set a budget for it, but it's going to be uh, at least to the uh, to the extent of what the uh, the county is considering here today. So it's going to we're uh, um, we're going through the budget process right now. So those uh, those numbers will be identified there. But it's going to it's uh, it's going to take an effort to um, in our minds is to uh, inform and educate and let our residents make the uh, the proper decision. But talking about the importance of uh, of the census in terms of uh, that population count. So. We will be identifying a, a budget. It hasn't been um, determined just yet, but it'll be at least what the county is, is discussing here today. Thank you. I guess I have one more question, Mr. Chair. I should have asked Toby, but every election we have, we have terrible voter turnout, no matter what it is. <laughs> that doesn't make any difference. So obviously, the more we educate people and do everything, doesn't seem to work because they don't care about voting, they don't care about bonds, they don't care about anything. I think the only way is going door to door. Do you see anything that's better than that? Door to door is going to be, uh, Supervisor Johnson, vitally important. But I think beyond that is, is uh, we've had some initial conversations at our Tri-City Council meetings where we're talking about maybe doing some type of a uh, campaign uh, through social media or s little uh, small videos just to show the, uh, the importance of uh, what, the, what the census uh, uh, does and uh, um, the options tied to it, whether you want to give uh, pertinent information or personal information or not. Um, how do you fill it out if you're a seasonal resident? There's a lot of questions that uh, came up at the meeting here today that our, our residents are going to have as well, too. So trying to answer some of those questions from a more global perspective. So we'll, uh, we'll do some videos, we'll do some social media, and honestly, it's probably a better deal if we did had combined efforts with, uh, with those videos and that social media. So it shouldn't necessarily be about getting uh, the count for a census for Lake Havasu City. It should be uh, you know, getting the, uh, the census count uh, um, maximized for the, uh, for the region, for, Mah for the county as well. It'll, it's gonna be a, a lot of things. Yeah. So relying on one effort is, isn't gonna do the trick. There's gonna be about uh, 10 different approaches that we're gonna have to take to kind of reach <coughs> the different people out there that, uh, that need that information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Knutson, as long as I've been in the area, the residents of the Lake Havasu area have wanted an olive garden. Okay. <laughs> there is a population threshold to get an olive garden. I would suggest that we make this part of our campaign okay. is the, the Olive Garden goal. If the Olive Garden census. That, we need yeah. that count so we can get a dang Olive Garden. Uh, you said it, I didn't. That's <laughs> but, I, but, I, but that's the sentiment, is that if we want to attract those types of uh, businesses to our area, we need, sure. uh, we need counts. Thank you. Possibly yeah. another idea might be, because 
we are dependent on the herf dollars for all our roads, we might want to indicate if you want more potholes, don't be counted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's if, a million. If you're not counted, you'll get more potholes or something to that effect. But that certainly will be the case. It's part of the funding formula. But it would be nice that if all of the promotions and those kinds of things would be coordinated, so we're not, you know, just throwing out these, you know, taglines. Okay, thank you very much. Madam Chairman, yes. the representative from Colorado City is also here. Okay, would he like to speak? Mayor Allred. Oh, Mayor, I thought city manager was here. I misspoke, That's I'm sorry. Okay. Hello, Mayor. Good morning, Joseph Allred, Colorado City Mayor. Um, as the representative from Lake Havasu said, then we haven't set a budget item amount for this, but we are on board with helping however we can in providing staffing and organizing community efforts to raise awareness. And, and we are willing to put some people on that and absorb it into our administration budget. And, and we, we may or may not appoint a specific budget amount for that. But from the discussions I've had with our town manager, then we're, we're on board for helping and coordinating. We, if we need to provide a representative to be on a, a larger committee uh, on a countywide effort, we're willing to do that also, just according to your need. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Any you. Questions? Okay then. So back to the, uh, the agenda item. What's your pleasure? Chairman Angus, I, I would make a motion that we approve item 44 as written. We can always come back and visit that and, and make adjustments if need be. But I, I think the sooner we get this started, the better prepared we will be for the, uh, the ultimate goal of, of counting our citizens. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second the motion. Okay. Um, does anyone want to discuss before we vote? I would, Madam Chair. I, I think that if we're asking the cities, you know, if they want to partner with us, and all of a sudden we're, you know, forming our own committee with nobody from the cities on it, that seems kind of, you know, that doesn't give them the right, right uh, feeling, I don't think. I think just the continuing of it till it gets gets done right. I mean, the like I said in the backup, there's 15, 20, 30, 40 people on these committees, and we're putting what people from the county on it. All people from the county on it doesn't seem right to me. That's just my opinion. Well, that's true, Chairman Angus. That that's mm -hmm. definitely a, a concern. But the the cities are forming their committees, so you know, somebody's got to start. Somebody has to be first, and somebody has to be last. So you know, I think. I think our committee needs to begin formation and then get with the cities and maybe consolidate from there. I guess I have one question for you. What exactly does Tim Walsh bring to the table on this committee? Uh, Madam Chairman, Supervisor Johnson um, means that I didn't have to do it. Amen <laughs> 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 to that. You know, um, one of the things that we looked at when we looked at uh, uh, county staff, we looked at resources and what resources might be needed to make a successful count committee. So that's why uh, the county uh, uh, departments or elected officials that you see on this committee were selected because we believed, you know, it's necessary for development services, um, you know, to identify properties, assessors uh, to identify properties, uh, you know, um, it could be anybody. We wanted to give the board a start so that you all could make a, a good business decision on this committee on who you wanted to include. Ideally, um, I, I agree with Supervisor Johnson 100% uh, that you know it needs to be door to door, and so this committee could be huge uh, eventually. But this is a start, and without a start, without a seed, we're not going to get anywhere. So, uh, what you see is what staff's best recommendation was for a start for a seed. Thank you. 
<coughs> Madam Chairman, mm -hmm. I seconded the motion uh, made by Supervisor Bishop, um, but in rethinking what I <coughs> what I would really like to see is the three or the four cities, as Bullhead City did, make a determined dollar commitment before we go any further on making our commitment. Let's say, for instance, the city of Kingman decides, well, the county's doing 75,000, so let's, do, let's just do 25. Once we understand their commitment, I think it'd be easier for us to make this decision. So with that logic, mm -hmm. I'll pull my second. Okay, and, and I tend to agree with that. I think there's just not enough um, thought and not enough um, planning yet to go forward with this. So I tend to agree, but there's a motion and he pulled his second. He did pull a second and I will withdraw my motion, but uh, I, I think we need to uh, agendize this soon and, and get it organized and Okay, formed, so would you so. like to continue it for how long? And ask to come back with a more specific plan of action. Madam Chair, I think it could just die of lack of action, and then as soon as somebody gets something, they can put it back on, because I'm guessing that the manager will be talking to the other cities to find out what's going on, and they'll bring okay. it back, instead of All putting right. the time on. Does that sound okay? Why? All right, so this uh, item 44 dies for a lack of second, oh. and... Uh, and the motion was withdrawn as well. It was withdrawn, Yeah. Yes, there's no exactly. motion. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone who came to speak to that. Now we're on the consent agenda. Consent agenda items five through 30, 31. I think I had that wrong. Will be considered as a group. Is it 31, Ginny? Okay. Um, will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion minus any items pulled for discussion. Supervisor Watson. None. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, items 15 and 17. 15 and 17. Supervisor Bishop. None. Supervisor Johnson. No. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 I got to. I got to pull twenty-five and thirty. I'll second motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So number fifteen is to approve amendment number two for contract uh, for an Arizona prescription drug overdose prevention program between the Arizona Department of Health and Mojave County Department of Health. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Denise, where's this, it's, you're asking for another $25,000. Um, where does that $25,000 come from? The, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Supervisor Gould, the state provides those funds to us. So that's state money, not correct. general fund money? That's correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? Thank you, motion. Uh, Madam Chairman, I move that item 15 be adopted. All in favor? Oh, I need a second. I'm sorry. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Number 17, approve Mojave County's warrant register for March 2019 in the amount of $5,155,996.40. Five Supervisor is that you? Yes, it is. <laughs> I had a question on a particular item on the warrant register, um, we have $6,000 for making the cut barber. I'm curious, what, what did we spend on, six, or what was $6,000 spent for, for making the cut barber? Good morning, Chairman Angus and Supervisors. Supervisor Gould, I do not know the answer to that question. We'll have to look it up. Um, I can email that to all of the board members, or we can bring it back at the next meeting, whatever you'd prefer. I could get it right away, though. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. you okay with that? Yeah, we can go ahead and vote it, but I'm curious. Okay. I'm curious what the $6,000 for the barbershop was. Mm -hmm. um, Madam Chairman, I move that item 17 be adopted. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried, number 25. Now, 25, um, we have people signed up for it. That's one of the reasons I took it out. 
authorize the part-time employment of Gary Engels as a special investigator to investigate possible voter fraud in Colorado City during the 2018 election. The expenditures for this employment investigation shall not exceed $8,000 and shall come from county general funds. We have our county attorney here, Matt Smith, who'd like to speak on this. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of our esteemed Board of Supervisors, Madam Clerk, County Manager, Mr. Hendricks, Attorney Ryan Esplin. Uh, the reason for this request was that our office, namely Lenore Knutson and our Civil Division, received some information from some members in the Colorado City area that there may have been voter fraud that took place back in the year 2018 during various elections. Specifically, that there were people that no longer lived at a particular address that was listed in the voter registration records that voted in the election, uh, presumably uh, having lived at that address. We also had some information from some uh, sources and informants that they knew that the people, not only that the people listed on voter registration were not living at that residence, but they knew who was living at that residence and they weren't the same people. Additionally, we had information provided to us that there were some mail ballots that had been intercepted and had been filled out by people that were no longer living at a particular residence. Uh, this information came to the attention of uh, our county uh, recorder's office, I think elections department, but one way or another, I got back to Lenore Knudsen, who then talked to me. At that time, I talked to Gary Engels, and Gary Engels is a former member of the Bullhead City Police Department and was the Colorado City investigator here from about 2004 till about 2015. And so uh, Gary actually has gone up there a couple of times, so we've gotten some free labor. Uh, and has talked to the particular informant, the main witness, as well as some other people up there. And he seems to feel that there is some credible information that there were people that did not live at a particular residence that in fact did vote during the last election cycle. Uh, Gary has also spent time meeting with me and Lenore. He's met with our county recorder along with me. Uh, a little background on Gary Engels. Uh, Buster Johnson, of course, knows him because he's been on the board for a long time. Uh, Gary was the one that was appointed by uh, Buster Johnson and Pete Byers and Tom Sockwell back in 2004 when I first moved from a prosecutor into this position, specifically to look into the underage marriages and things that were going on up in Colorado City. <coughs> Now, Gary had been a Bullhead City Police Department officer, previously a law enforcement officer with multiple agencies in the state of Colorado, and uh, had investigated everything from domestic violence to first degree murder during his time in Bullhead City. The reason that uh, I brought his name in front of the board was that a former uh, media member of the Bullhead City area, Richard Kaffenberger, uh, who some of you might remember, had actually gone up there to do a story and he had brought Gary up there to kind of watch his back. And Gary and I had kept in touch after he retired from the Bullhead City Police Department, told me about what he saw going on up there. And so uh, I thought he was the perfect person to look into these allegations. The reason I wanted to look into these allegations was when I first got into the county attorney position, I uh, did the uh, speaking circuit, which everybody does, Rotary, Kiwanis, all the Republican clubs throughout the county. And the thing that I was hearing from everybody was, what are you gonna do about Colorado City? And specifically about the allegations uh, that were brought to light uh, by Flora Jessup and some of the other people who uh, Buster Johnson had a lot of contact with and promoted uh, our efforts back in the day, that uh, there were underage marriages going on uh, and as a result of Gary Engels being appointed by the board and his investigation uh, into the matter, we indicted eight different people, went to trial on three of them, got convictions on five, and ultimately led to the warrants that uh, resulted in the arrest of Warren Jeffs. So Gary is somebody who has specific local knowledge because he spent 11 years uh, of his life uh, 
with a large part of it, even though he lives in the Bullhead area, staying in Hurricane, Utah, and spending time in Colorado City. He knows his way around. He has informants. He has friends up there, people that will talk to him. And so I think he is the best qualified person to look into this matter. What we're requesting is an expenditure out of the general funds of no more than $8,000, which would include his salary, which I believe is going to be approximately $21 an hour, which is what we pay our other investigators. Uh, hotel, car, per diem, you know, expenses, everything not to exceed $8,000. Now, I'm not going to say that if he uncovers something major that I might not come back in front of you and ask that we consider, you know, hiring him as a, you know, for a lengthier period of time. But generally, right now, we're looking at not spending more than $8,000 on this. I think this is really a, a board decision. It seems like something because it, voter fraud and the possibility of it is very real. Uh, we are all, you know, five of, of you and, and myself are elected officials. Uh, I, I know I don't do very well up there, so it's not a personal concern for me because I get hardly any votes out of that area. But it is a concern, I think, for uh, to have uh, accountability and to uh, have uh, people voting that actually live at the address that they're living at. Uh, again, I think it should be a decision up to the board. I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have considering this matter. Um, I don't think that uh, it is going to be something that we're necessarily going to see great results out of because the lack of cooperation that Gary has had in the past and other people have had in the past, including our sheriff's office, is something that we're going to have to deal with. It is very difficult to prove things. It is difficult to go and knock on doors and get people to actually open the door and answer questions. So it's not going to be something that's easily done. But the last point I want to make, I think that having somebody going up there and poking around and investigating it will put people on notice if, in fact, there is inappropriate conduct going on up there, uh, that we are taking a look at it, that we're taking it seriously. And I think it would have a great deterrent effect, if nothing else, even if we don't end up uh, finding anything or charging anybody with any crimes. I think it will help preserve the integrity of the election system. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Smith? <clears throat> yes, Chairman. Thank you. Just wanted to make a couple things clear in my mind, Mr. Smith. Uh, this was initiated by a resident of Colorado City and not by our recorder or elections department absolutely is that correct? correct yes it, it wasn't something initiated by uh, staff our elected official our recorder or even our uh, head of our elections department mr. Tempert. it was information that came from a particular citizen uh, and then that led to talking to a couple other citizens up there about uh, just his knowledge that uh, you know looking at voter registration and then finding out who voted and then seeing that okay I know that these people don't even live here. They don't live in Colorado City anymore. Uh, as you might be aware, the population of Colorado City has gone down uh, dramatically uh, over the last five or six years, where a lot of them have moved uh, to some of the other neighboring states. A lot of them moved to Texas when they opened the compound down there. So the population has gone down. But it is actually information from citizens that live up in that area. So, uh, this would have been the, the, the city election for city council members and f probably for their fire board also? Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. I appreciate what, you, what you're doing and looking into voter fraud no matter, no matter where it's at. Um, and I think it's something the board should look into, I think, because we have a lot of complaints from just people in the United States about how elections are held. And I, I don't mind spending the money to do this. The only thing that bothers me is the last time that you went ahead and prosecuted an illegal voting, our good judicial system here let them go. And that, that just fries me that you know, we have judges that make that kind of decision from the bench. But that was just my shot at the judges. Understood. Uh, I have a question. You said that this was 
uh, precipitated by, by complaints from people. Do we get, compl we get complaints all the time from the county for alleged abuses, things. So why would this be different? Because you, you haven't really looked into voter fraud uh, for the rest of the county. Well, there have been, during election years, uh, our office ends up getting complaints from different people that are running for office. And those are areas that we do look into. But actual voter fraud, uh, I can't think of anything specific that in, in my 15 and a quarter years in this position that I've ever actually looked into it before. Uh, what I would say is, is that the person that originally reported it uh, seemed to know what he was talking about. Uh, I just gave it away that it's a male, but that you know, only knocks it down to 50% of the population. Uh, the information that was vetted by Lenore Knutson in talking to this person and then uh, having our investigator, our former investigator, Gary Engel, spend a couple of trips up there visiting people where he actually talked to this person, talked to some other people. And so uh, we did a little follow-up investigation and it cost me a lunch uh, that I bought Gary. But other than that, there were no county funds expended. Uh, our office did not provide him any money or resources. So he looked into this on his own, went up there two separate times. And based on his experience and what he knows, he seems to believe that there was something to these complaints. Um, he actually went to some of the homes and, uh, you know, people there said, hey, this person's listed as on the voter reg is living here. Uh, we then have gotten lists from our recorder. Uh, Gary Ingalls has had a chance to look at that. And we have people that are saying those people don't live there anymore. And in okay. fact, I know who does live there. This is who does live there. Okay. Um, just one other question. I mean, you brought this to the board. You think it should be a board decision, but ordinarily, wouldn't this just be your depart your division's call and the money would come out of your budget? Well, that would be one way that it could happen. <laughs> my, my preference uh, would be to, uh, to have it be a board expenditure um, because uh, we would have to come up with the funds out of our budget as it exists right now. Uh, I think this is something that has countywide importance. Um, we have at least, well, one of our supervisors, of course, that would be uh, getting votes from that area. I don't want to get into the politics of, of all of that, but. Okay, um, any other questions? We do, thank you. We do have uh, several people signed up and they came all the way from Colorado City. First up is uh, the mayor again, uh, Joseph Allred. Good afternoon again, uh, board members. Um, I'm Joseph Allred, Colorado City Mayor. I just wanted to um, maybe, I, I know this isn't new information for you, but maybe for the benefit of the public, the, the uh, election was completely administered by the county. And as far as the city government goes, we didn't handle any ballots, we didn't count any ballots or verify any ballots. It's all something done by the county. and. Um, I believe that the county has a very competent and honest staff, so I don't really have any, any questions there. Um, there are a lot of rumors that fly around through the media about Colorado City all the time, and I just wanted to ask all of you to be careful that we're not throwing a lot of money and time at chasing rumors. Um, I don't know this particular allegation, except for what I've been contacted by the media. Uh, we haven't been contacted by the county on anything. But, uh, and I just heard about it a, a couple of days ago. But uh, I just want to be careful that we're not just babysitting somebody's bad feelings about the outcome of the election. So, but as far as the town government goes and our perspective, we're here to help. 
we we want we want it to be fair. We want it to be honest. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I, and I'm here available for any questions if you have any. But. Any questions for the mayor? Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks. Next up is Loretta Barlow. Uh, thank you for taking the time to hear me. Uh, I have not been sent here by anyone. I chose to uh, get off work, drive down here this morning. Um, I'm not representing anyone, but one person, one voter. Um, I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of an idea of what the situation is in Colorado City. Um, I, I and my family of seven, including myself, have been displaced from Colorado City by a court order to eviction. Um, we, when, when the election came, <coughs> we knew that we didn't, we wanted to vote Mojave County. Our, our uh, mailing address is Mojave County. Our location where we are now is only temporary. We have not registered to vote in any other state or county. And the question that rose in my mind was, am I eligible to vote in Mojave County and in Arizona? So I called the uh, elections information and the answer that I was, I, the question I asked was, can I, as a displaced resident of Colorado City in Mojave County, can I continue to vote as registered, even being displaced temporarily. And they said, the answer was, if you have not registered to vote elsewhere, you intend on moving back into Mojave County, there is no reason why you shouldn't be able to vote on your current voter registration and, and uh, maintain, because we were, we were maintaining our mailing address in the community because we, we didn't have anywhere else to send the mail. Hmm. I, I am not an isolated incident. There are hundreds of families dealing with the same thing. At the poll, um, I had left my voter registration card at my residence, my temporary residence, and at the poll I was not able to provide a current utility bill because we had the utilities disconnected when we were evicted. And so they processed my information and provided me with a provisional ballot. Um, I, I felt like that that was very fair. I didn't produce the documents required for the, for the other ballot, the official ballot. And um, I felt like that the poll was ran very professionally, and I, I felt like the people there were very honest. Um, uh, if there is a, a if there is election fraud, I totally agree with investigating it, absolutely. But if it is fraud, I do not believe that it was committed at the city level. I believe it would, it would have been committed at the county level and the investigation needs to be a county-wide investigation if there is to be one. And also, if, when and if you choose an investigator to conduct that investigation, you be very careful to choose an investigator that will conduct an unbiased investigation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Chairman, if I could please, I'd like to interject a point. Okay. Uh, Ms. Barlow is not a unique circumstance. There have been many people that have been displaced in that community and uh, for, for several reasons. Uh, one being probably the most prevalent reason is the UEP trust with the new trustees taking possessions of different properties and then putting other people in it. 
So this is not a simple solution of just going to try to find a person that filled out the form and said I'm breaking the law. <clears throat> it's the complexity of the entirety up there. So I'm sure that Mr. Engels will understand that, but in order for us to, uh, to make sure that those folks that were elected uh, in that election uh, can be vindicated, mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea to go ahead and carry forth with that with, with the thought that uh, those circumstances are certainly not unique, as Ms. Barlow indicated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I find it interesting that, um, is that our policy, that if you come and say that you're not living there, you know, but you tend to come back and, you know, you can't provide any, any proof that you live at this address, that the county will accept that? I believe you'd have to ask the recorder. Is she here? Yeah, come on. And if I could, while she's coming down, if I could jump into that as well. I mean, the, the Title 16, the election laws discuss, they, they have qualifications for people who do not have a permanent residence so that they can vote. And our, uh, the county recorder and the county elections department both follow those statutes. If you look at 16121, a person who does not reside at a fixed, permanent, or private structure shall be properly registered to vote if that person is qualified. So if you meet the qual basic qualifications to, to vote, and then if you list a number of places, you could list a homeless shelter, you could list the place at which the registrant is registered, you could list the county courthouse, you could, you could list the general delivery address for the post office. So there's four different things that you could list if you are homeless, if you don't have, if you have a temporary, uh, if you don't have a permanent fixed private structure, so. But that doesn't mean that you're like staying with other people, that's a permanently fixed. No, you still could be registered to vote. If you're, if you're registered to vote, if you reside in the, in the jurisdiction and you intend to reside there, you can, that, can be a place, that, that can be a place that you can register to vote, if that's where you're staying. I mean, that's what that statute's saying right there. I mean, you, there's different places that you can list if, if, you're, if you have a temporary, if, you're, if you don't have a fixed, permanent, or pr private structure. Okay, Supervisor Johnson. I think, I think you do a lot of that, Madam Chair, too, if it's, you know, the military is obvious one where people are stationed other places, but they use their family home or people in school or even people who they consider, and especially with Colorado City, they consider that there's more of a tie into that town than most towns would have. And while they go out on mission work or when they go out to work in some other area, they consider that their home and they vote there. The, the question comes from is if they vote in two elections, but then with the court case that we had in Mojave County, they found the person innocent because they didn't vote twice for the same person, even though they voted in two different states. If they would have voted twice for the president, then they could have gotten them. And I see the, I saw what the judge was saying, but I disagree with it because that means that we can all go to, you know, Needles and vote in their city election and then, you know, Bullhead and vote in theirs and so. Yeah, I think it's a slippery slope. Yes. Uh, Christy, just, just to clarify, you don't have to, you know, the, Ryan did that into the law itself. I'm sorry. So the question, the, the, the young lady said that, um, you know, she's displaced and that she came to the county and asked if it was okay to vote because, and she had no, um, you know, proof that she was there. She's displaced, but she intends to come back. Is that, I mean, if, if is that the policy of the county? Because what they're saying is if you're looking at fraud, you should look at the county. That's what she, that's what she just said. So you have to be registered in Mojave County to vote in Mojave County. If you're temporarily away, you can give us an address and we will mail you a ballot outside of the area. Um, if you're homeless, you can have a general delivery address. There's a variety of things, but the, the, the key is that you are a Mojave County resident. So if on election day, which elections um, is responsible for that, um, they did the appropriate thing. And then that would have been uh, validated after the election to see if that was um, valid. If we're, given, if we're given an address and we have no information that it's any different, um, 
there's nothing we have to go on. If you say you live at this address, and um, in Colorado City, as other small townships are, all of your mail is by postal service. You don't have home delivery. So I'm not exactly sure that the interpretation, you know, you have to be a resident of Mojave County in order to vote there. If you've been displaced, if you are living somewhere else, we would um, expect to have that information and that your voter registration form would have been updated with that correct information. So then there's a variety of situations. If you're temporarily away in another state working or something like that, but you are still a resident of Mojave County, you, you still have the right to vote. Does that answer that? Kinda. Okay, anyone want to say something? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Can I, can I just ask um, uh, Ms. Barlow something? When you told the county that you were displaced, were you out of the county at the time when you were displaced to another state or were you still in Mojave County? In Mojave County? Okay, out of, out of state. Okay, I think that's the, the hiccup right here. Um, and Matt, can I, can I ask you something? W were you aware of that particular situation that, and apparently as um, Supervisor Watson said, that is not untypical up there. So is that, is that what this is about, you think? I don't believe that's what this is about, but I, I am aware of that situation, and I am aware that uh, there have been people in the past that have been uh, kicked out of the FLDS community, and so uh, based on that, sometimes they've been removed from their home, uh, removed from their family, and so some of those people have been displaced and actually do not live in Mojave County anymore. You also have the jurisdictional issue of the fact that Mojave County and uh, Washington County, there's a street right in the middle of Colorado City, Hilldale, called Uzona. And if you're, depending on which side of the street you live on, uh, can determine which state you actually live in. So you have uh, two states that are really all part of one city. So. That is a jurisdictional nightmare as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We do have one other person signed up from Colorado City, and that is Christine Marie. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I run a nonprofit in Colorado City that helps. Oh, XFLDS and FLDS. We do humanitarian aid. I mean, we've helped many, many, many people. And when I moved to the community three years ago, I believed all these things that I had read in the media. And to my shock, uh, the people in this community were um, incredibly different, honest, kind, loved their children, wanted them to be educated, wanted to protect them, entirely different from the stories that we read in the past. Thank you for being open-minded to, to let me talk for a minute about what is happening now, and please let whatever you thought in the past be in the past. What I have seen is that people get evicted. I am the intermediary between the FLDS and the UEP Trust, which, e which evicts. I know this situation v on a very deep level. I'm allowed in the homes of many, many FLDS. I have no trouble getting access to information. If you want to save money, you can ask me uh, where somebody lives or, what, or you know, things like that. This doesn't have to be some secretive investigation. I believe we can get to the bottom of things with some transparency. But when people are evicted, they move to another home that somebody's already in, and another home, and they pile on top of each other like sardines. Sometimes they live in sheds, some RVs, 
man camps, and shipping containers. Sometimes they're on this side of the border and that side of the border. They're, they are homeless people. These are considered homeless people if they are not in a permanent situation which is healthy and productive and stable and where the family intends to live. If they're just surviving, they can't unpack their stuff. They are homeless, even if they are living with somebody else. We were very aware of the elections due to things that happened in the Hildale election, it was common knowledge that there would probably be accusations of voter fraud in Colorado City. We knew this before the election. I did a telephone call with the county elections officer too, I believe it was Christy, but I can't quite remember. And I had FLDS in the room on speakerphone because they were all afraid to vote. Can we vote in this situation? And I'm so grateful for those of you who understand how complex it is. What did not happen is people did not receive something in the mail that says, please unregister yourself from that address, from your old address. Now, in these houses, people have gone from house to house to house. Even when, you know, even 15 years ago, they would move, they would move based on need. So, Many people are still registered at a house that even our ex-FLDS, that is partially why, I mean, they've told me themselves that they did not vote because they never updated their address. So we have ex-FLDS and FLDS that may be registered in homes, but there is an enormous difference between having people registered to your house and people intentionally falsely trying to commit voter fraud. We, we discussed voter fraud and tried to educate them at length. These people did not want to commit voter fraud. Now, there was, there was a telephone campaign, Facebook campaigns, the minute the election was over and the FLDS kept the majority. People uh, tried to I mean, there was a conversation about just swarming the governor's office and the, and the county prosecutor and so on to let them know that the FLDS had committed fraud. I want to tell you something. As a person who does humanitarian work in this community, it is difficult for me to get donations and humanitarian aid for such a stigmatized ethnic group. And they are a religious ethnic group. Just to remind you, an ethnic group has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It's a shared history, a shared culture, shared language, religion, and so on. They are such an ethnic group that they refer to each other as one of our people. So we have an ethnic group that happens to be based on an unpopular religion. And we have a group of people in town that desperately want to take over the town. But all I have seen from the people that I know, and I know many, many on both sides, all I have seen from the FLDS is fear to vote. I, people who were registered to vote, who were moved and legally capable of voting were too afraid. That is what I have seen because of the things that have happened. And, and the constant stigmatization, and, and it seems as if, to me, that this is a politically motivated investigation. The very fact that you would pick Gary Engels, who I don't know, but because I saw press releases in the Associated Press already starting with this, you know, the, the increased stigmatization that there's some kind of organized criminal activity, voter fraud in Colorado City. Well, I don't buy it. I know these people. I know how hard everybody worked to remind each other, make sure your address is updated. They do not want, if, if it turns out somebody did commit voter fraud, I bet you that there will be people that are FLDS that cry in disappointment. Please, check yourself. Check your real motives. I know they're not a popular group, but they're kind and they're loving and they're different than the media says. And things today are not as they were before. Don't. Okay, th thank you very much. Thank Ray. you. Thank you for your passionate plea. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question for okay. Ms. Marie. Yes. Ms. Marie, I, I know of the work that you do up there, and thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Would you be willing to work with Mr. Uh, Mr. Engels? to help clarify these issues? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Save them some money and some time. Because it is such a, a complex situation up there between the movements uh, but in the and out. Yeah. I, think it, I think it only behooves us to make a decision to help clarify exactly what happened and help clarify in the question of many of the people up there, are they qualified to vote <coughs> or are they not qualified to vote? If they're claiming their domicile in Colorado City but have been forced to move to Hilldale, which is maybe two blocks away. Right. Uh, it's, it's not a, an easy situation to comprehend, nor is it, one, is it going to be easy to find a solution. But I think we can answer a number of questions to make it much easier for the citizens of that area to, uh, to be okay. able to exercise their vote. So okay. right. with that, I would recommend a motion for uh, authorizing uh, Mr. Engels uh, to investigate. Okay, um, motion to discuss one last thing. I just want to remind everyone that um, an investigation is not just to find something wrong, it's to vindicate as well. And if there are these things hovering around there, this can only be good if what you're saying is completely true. And maybe we could you know, figure out some other policies for the future from it, okay? So we have a, a motion and a second. Uh, let's take a roll call. <coughs> Supervisor Watson? Yes. Supervisor Johnson? Yes. Supervisor Bishop? Yes. Supervisor Gould? Aye. And Chairman Angus? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. And thank you, everybody who came down here from Colorado City. That is not a short drive. Five minute break? Yeah. We're going to take a 10 minute break. How's that? And we'll be back here. It is now um, 1125, so at 1135.
House meeting is back in session, and we have one more uh, item on the consent agenda to uh, go over, and that is item number 30, which is approve the proposed revisions to the Department of Public Health Policies and Procedures on Special Event Temporary Food Establishment Permits. Um, I, I think that um, I was somewhat involved in this. Um, we had some complaints from some businesses in my district. Um, they just wanted to be able to have uh, several events. They have two locations. And I was told that the county only al allows one permit per location a year. So when I asked why, I was told that it had something to do with the fact that we're not staffed enough to go out and inspect, to which I was basically flabbergasted, saying, so we're hindering commerce because our own policies, we can't enforce our own policies. So I spoke to Denise and uh, she's come up with this. So I, I have a couple of questions about it, but is there anything you want to explain to the board? Certainly, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, we reviewed our policy and just talking with staff and learning the history of it, it was really um, that number, that number one for the temporary food service permits was selected due to staff capacity to inspect all the different events and organizations participating. So that's why it was initially put in that, um, you know, that designation was just for one, with the exception of nonprofits for fundraising purposes. Those organizations were allowed four. So in reviewing this, we talked with staff and, you know, there's always that trickle down effect of changing one thing and then going, oh, but that affects this group and that affects this group. So then we need to make those considerations. So um, in the end, we did remove all the limitations. So there are no limitations on this, which does align us with state law. So we are aligned with state law, which you explained to me hasn't been updated for how many years? It's been a while. And so that they're are... telling us that we should go by Maricopa's we are ordinances? required by law, actually, through our um, agreement with the state to use Maricopa County's. Um, yeah, because they're so much like us. Ordinance. Thank you. I want to make sure I get my terminology right. correct. But we have latitude through the county to make changes like this. We do in this case, yes, okay. as long as we're not stricter than the state or stricter than Maricopa County. Oh, yeah, County. I don't think that would be possible. Okay, well, um, I'm looking at it, and the things in yellow are the, what you've deleted, and so um, if you're telling me that, do you think that we're going to have enough staff? I mean, have you projected what this that might be? I mean, it might just be a few. It might not be a lot. Right, right, right. This is where the trickle-down effect comes, okay. because then it, it, it could be churches that want to host pancake breakfasts, and so you have, um, it opens the door pretty wide. And so that's why we were requesting an additional staff person. But we do have some time between now and the start of a budget year uh, to make those decisions to kind of see how that work flows for us as well. Right. So if, if you, you don't see the numbers going up dramatically, you're not going to hire another staff person. Right. We'll evaluate as we go along here. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? Yes, Madam Chair. So because it's on here it's saying you're looking at another person at the budget time. Correct. We have an ask, sorry, we have requested another position, an EH2 position in the budget process. Um, and that person would be specifically for special events, temporary events. We're actually looking at this person working like a Tuesday through Monday schedule so that they would have the weekend work and most of the temporary events. And this doesn't require a public hearing to the changes you're making? It does not because it actually is making it less restrictive. We, we, did talk we don't with, need to notify the public of that? We did talk with the county attorney, and he, he, he explained the reasons why um, this wasn't necessary. The public hearing wasn't necessary. Yes, uh, Chairman uh, Angus, if I may answer that. If you go to 11251.18, um, there is an exception where, go down to the bottom here, the section for the public hearing stuff, things like that, does not apply to procedural documents that affect only internal procedures. This is a procedure. If you look at the top there, procedure, I'm talking about procedures that we're doing and that do not impose additional requirements, conditions, or penalties on regulated parties. So here we're actually allow, we're decreasing, we're allowing greater use as opposed to regulating or putting on additional requirements or conditions. So that's why you don't need to do that. And just to give the boards a head up, heads up on the health department, all special events. I think we're going to see something brought forward 
wanting um, notification of like people attending these events um, just because of like the mass confusion in, in Las Vegas when you have you know runners and things like that just something else that will be coming up that might take more staffing okay anyone else yes Denise, is the fee structure going to cover the cost of the employee? Or yes. will it be a burden at, on the general fund? At, at this point, that is correct, yes. We've anticipated the fees that may be included, the, the revenue that would be generated as a result of the inspections that would be completed, and the permit, actually the permits that would be um, paid for at that time. So, yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, um, I will make this motion. I want to thank you very much. Um, for acting so quickly, and um, my constituents are very happy about it as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I okay, also, so, uh, um, excuse sorry. me? I just wanted to introduce Ron Balsamo. He is the new environmental health manager, so um, he'll be kind of helping me along with uh, Becky still on environmental health questions. So, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I have a motion to approve item 30. So moved. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, so now we're going to the regular agenda. Let me go back to my notes. So items 32 through 35 are basically asking for the same thing. And so for um, brevity, I'm going to just read what the change is after I read the first one. So item 32 is discussion and possible action to acknowledge receipt of and refer to public works for staff evaluation and recommendation for future board discussion and possible action, a regular road maintenance petition to the Mavi County Board of Supervisors requesting that North Boulder Road from East Colorado Drive to 0.25 miles north of East California Drive in the Valley Vista area be accepted into the Mojave County Road System for regular maintenance subject to meeting all applicable requirements. Again, I want to remind everybody this is just to refer this to public works. <clears throat> Madam Chairman? Yes. Uh, is it your desire to include 32 through 35 in one motion? Can we do that? I'd rather just do it one by one, make it clean. Okay. Okay. I'd like to <clears throat> move for the approval of item number 32. Second. Okay. Motion to discuss? I've got a question for Mr. Lutoski. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Lutoski, um, are, in items 32 through 35, are these paved roads or are these unpaved roads? Hi, good morning, uh, members of the board, Chairman Angus, uh, Supervisor Gould. Uh, I was inclined to uh, uh, suspect that all of these roads are uh, unpaved roads and uh, they, in fact, uh, would be unpaved roads. Okay. So the challenge here would be for the petitioners uh, upon this acknowledgement by the board to uh, take it upon themselves to uh, facilitate upgrading the roadways to a minimum Mojave County standard uh, for maintenance acceptance uh, at no cost to Mojave County. So, Madam Chairman, Mr. Latoski, the minimum standard is that a compact car can drive on the roads I'm without hitting boulders <coughs> and bushes? All of these uh, petitions, uh, Supervisor uh, Gould, uh, pertain to regular road maintenance. So, as a matter of fact, uh, these uh, roadways would have to conform to uh, uh, Mojave County Standard Detail Section 60 in uh, being uh, uh, essentially uh, just those conditions you described, but also uh, provide for a 24-foot wide travel lane with 8-foot shoulders and then the minimum requisite right-of-way for their functional class, which is likely uh, 50 to 60 feet, but uh, we would have to uh, check that, of course. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have, a, I have a, just a, a format question, a process question. So we get these all the time just to refer through the petitions because we give the, our constituents, we give the, our, our um, citizens that right to do that. What percentage of them are actually, you know, they follow through and then we actually take them into maintenance, would you say? I don't expect a 100% you know, answer. But. Um, Chairman Angus, uh, I would suspect less than 50%. Uh, 50 or 15? 50, five zero. Okay. Uh, um, most likely a, a third or so. Um, generally, uh, there's tremendous momentum to get the petition going, 
And uh, if uh, we see those roads acted upon, they will be acted upon in a relatively short manager. This acknowledgement is uh, quite important uh, to both public works, but particularly to the petitioners, as uh, uh, it kind of gives them a green light, uh, so to speak, uh, whether or not to consider uh, an expenditure on the roadway. Uh, okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I need a motion. Oh, we do. Sorry about that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. I believe that was three to two. Okay. The next one is the same acknowledgement receipt and refer to Public Works um, that the East Canyon Drive between Antares Road and North Boulder Road in the Valley Vista area be accepted into Mojave County Road System for regular maintenance subject to meeting all applicable requirements. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, three to two. See a trend. Item 34, acknowledge receipt of and refer to public works. This time it's South of Elfrida Road from, is that Chuar Road? How do you say that? It's close enough. Is that it? Chuar Road, north for 0.2 miles in the Golden Valley area be accepted in the Mojave County Road System. Motion to approve. Do I have a second? Yes. Yeah. All Aye. in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Item 35, acknowledgement receipt of and for the public works, um, East California Drive between Antares Road and North Boulder Road in the Valley Vista area be accepted into Mojave County Road System. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Number 36. These are um, brought to us by Supervisor Johnson, uh, 36 to 40, uh, 41. Um, discussion possible action to approve the Mojave County Fairgrounds Association purchasing Mojave County Public Works Vehicle, number 2681, a 2006 Ford F-350 with approximately 157 miles, 157,399 miles for a price to be determined and set by the Board of Supervisors source to this fund. Uh, Board of Supervisors restricted projects and payable to fund 205-34301, the Highway User Revenue Fund. And um, just want to remind this needs to be a unanimous vote because we're not going out to bid, right? That's or correct. No, that we're good because it's so, uh, we don't get the value? No, it's uh, any time you sell county property, it has to, be, uh, it has to be through public auction with the exception that you can do it, it through unanimous vote to a nonprofit. Very good. Okay. Supervisor Johnson, do you want to make a motion? Well, I brought this back um, because I think the last meeting we, the fair market price we were selling for appeared to be low. I, I put in the back of I could buy. It's up to the board to decide what they think the fair market value should be. Okay. <clears throat> Chairman Angus? Yes. I did some research on the item also. I noticed that the backup provided by Supervisor Johnson provided for uh, three quarter ton super duty crew cabs, uh, where in actuality the vehicle we're looking at is a <clears throat> 6 point two liter manual transmission, and it is what they call an extended cab, not a crew cab. The information that I've gathered from that uh, is if we were to be selling this to a private party, the low would be 4,752, the high to be 6,473. Uh, these are just based off my estimates. Uh, I would recommend that uh, if we did want to sell this to the Mojave County Fairgrounds Association, that a, a fair price might be in the neighborhood of $6,000. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on this? You want to put that in the form of a motion? Yes, I'll make a motion that we uh, authorize the sale of this vehicle to the Mojave County Fairgrounds Association for $6,000. Second. Okay, motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. 
Item 37, sitting as the Board of Directors of Mojave County Television Improvement District. Discussion, po possible action, direct staff to come back to the board within 30 days with a list of goals and objectives, as well as a mission statement from Mojave County's Television Improvement District. Um, this is just a direction to staff. Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I put this on because we have a lot of discussion lately about uh, possibly adding uh, channels to our um, TV translator district. And I thought maybe, you know, the few items we could do is, you know, whatever the majority of the board wants to do, like on our goals and objectives, I'm sure everybody has knows what the goals and objectives are. But if, you know, one of the biggest things is, do we want to decide if we want to be a, um, a translator district like we are now, or become an LPTV, you know, a low powered TV transmitter? Uh, the chief difference between the two types of stations, translators and LPTVs, is that the latter are not limited in the amount of programming they may originate, whereas translators are limited to a 30 seconds per hour. That's what we are now. If the county has to originate programming uh, in, in the form of like TV2 signal, there are FCC programming requirements that the county would need to observe. Well, some of these may also apply to TV translators Translators are typically able to re rely on a primary station they rebroadcast for compliance. And this would not necessarily be the case if the county was to originate programming as an LPTV. So I guess one of the questions would be, should the county decide to go forward with adding, um, you know, an unlicensed FCC channel or a government channel or any channel to our list that are not considered rebroadcasted stations then I believe it would need to become an LPTV licensee. That's the first one. I'll throw that one out there. Okay, well, <laughs> that's the first the I've heard. Is, is Yvonne Orr here? No? No? She's away, huh? She, well, uh, Yvonne's the one who's been, you know, she's the TV district, basically, and uh, she's been doing a lot of work on that, this, and seeing the way we could do this kind of thing and put local channels on, and, and I've never heard that. So I think that um, I, I like this, this idea that we should have some kind of list of goals and objectives and a mission statement about what we want this to be. I think that's a good idea and that's what we're voting on now. Okay, also um, the question still remains too, does the state statute give the county that authority? Because uh, state statute states that under ARS 48-1101, the Board of Supervisors of a county which meets the requirements of this subsection may establish a television improvement district for the purpose of acquiring, constructing, improving, extending, and maintaining and operating television translator and relay facilities to service the communications of the county. Now, I'm not sure if that gives us the ability to, you know, broadcast um, original equipment. So how about in this motion, uh, direct staff to come back with a list of goals and objectives as well as legal um, parameters? I would think we need to be more specific, specific. We do have a legal opinion already that says we can't put these other type stations on. We can't do it. So if we're going to, if our goal is as a majority of the board wants to try to do that, then we need to say come back with something that would help us get licensing, you know, FCC license so that we can rebroadcast. You know, okay. originate. Again, this original, is so. the first I'm, I'm hearing of this, so I'm, I'm okay with that yeah. if that's what you want to do. As long as I don't have to make the motion, I'm okay with it. Excuse me? As long as I don't have to make the motion, I, I, I can give it a try, I guess. Okay, um, make a motion to refer to staff to come back with um, appropriate goals for the 21st century up to and including possible changing of Mojave County's television district from translator to an originator of oh. TV signal. I'll second the motion. Okay. Anyone else? Um, we have a motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries on the same issue. Um, discussion possible about direct staff to come back to board within 30 days regarding a written policy for adding additional channels to our television district system, including a channel for rebroadcasting of lo local government meetings and local programs. So it's... Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know if we, if we covered it in the last one or not, because we, by that motion, we might have covered it. 
Uh, I think we have the same questions. Does the state law give us the authority? That's one of the questions that needs to be answered. I think, I, I guess when we do it too, we'll have to decide if we're going to do rebroadcast or original broadcasting, what would be the requirements for us to say, for an idea, okay, if they have to come back and they say there's four stations we can possibly get. Now, nobody else has licenses except Joe Hart. <laughs> so, so if we're not putting Joe Hart on, if we're looking at other stations, I've had some inquiries from um, people in Lake Havasu who do YouTube and that sort of thing wanting to do it. If that's something that we want to say, okay, it has to be local Mojave County things, or if you have somebody, because now it's YouTube, it could be somebody in the Phoenix area who does something that says, well, I do it for you. I guess we need to try to decide okay. if we're going to open it up, what would be our requirements, I guess. Right, and I yeah. think that's, that's different than the agenda item before, which is why I think this one's important. Okay. What, anyone else have any input? I guess I'd make a motion then to refer to staff to come back with a policy for well, with a, if there are channels available, and if we were to add local programming or additional programming to the, to the translator we have now, what would be the recommendations? Um, God, I hate to get in a long, long-winded thing, but would Not it be, be for, you know, to bring in like C-SPAN or something or bring in local local people if we're going to add if we have space available what would be the preference of mojave county and then it's pretty much what the item says uh, I think they're regarding a written policy for adding additional channels to our television district systems including a channel for rebroad or channels maybe for rebroadcasting of local government meetings and local we'll go off that that one then okay and i'll second the motion okay all in favor Aye. Aye. oh yeah go ahead Madam Chairman, I'm curious if we're going to expand this, is there a way that we could actually charge for this service to lift the burden off the backs of the taxpayer and put it on the people that want to put things on the channel? We I think might we want to include that in the motion, the uh, investigation into that? I, I think, Madam Chair, Supervisor Gould, the only people you could charge would be the new ones coming on the local people because the other, uh, other people, they have no... We do them a service, obviously, by carrying the Phoenix Station up here, but it's not their customer base, so we're getting Fox a bigger... Fox send us a check. Yeah, they're not going to send us Even a check, a but you, you could charge the <laughs> local guy saying, hey, we've got all over, and now you've got to pay us 10 cents of... Of course, we don't know how many customers we have, really, so... Yeah, we don't know. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on this one. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 39, discussion of possible action, direct staff to review and update within 60 days per direction from the board, the Mojave County Rules of Order and the agenda submission procedures. Thank you. Waiting for me, Madam yeah, Chair. Waiting for, yeah, you. waiting for my looking for my number. I don't have it in front of me right now, but um, I thought maybe we'd see where, which way the board wants to go because we we've, we've taken great latitude in a lot of things that we do. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> I think it should be run more as a business. Um, people have a, have all the opportunity in the world to approach their board members or staff or anybody else, but when we get you know, in public life or in private, but when we get to a meeting, we should be here for, for business. Um, and I'll kind of combine the two. We've gotten away from having agenda items come in late, which makes it very hard for us to, or at least for board members, to uh, address each of these. Each of you has a ton of work to do, and it's not just the board meeting. There's other things you have to do. And when uh, things aren't brought in, I know I'm sure other people besides myself yell at the clerk when the backup is not in on time. Uh, 
it makes it tough because the county attorney is supposed to review it, finance is supposed to review it, the manager is supposed to review it. Uh, we have a timeline that says on our rules that it's supposed to be in by Thursday at noon and people aren't getting them in and then, or they're getting them in incomplete and then they're adding stuff the next Tuesday or Wednesday which makes it tough if some of us are traveling or something to get it in. Um, I, think, I think what that was intended for originally was to say you have it in Thursday at noon completed so that basically the clerk should just have to give it a number and put it on so you don't have to worry about it. Um, I think I've gotten some, you know, people question me and I know we have it set up for the, for the chairman on um, timing people to speak, but some people are saying, well, we have to fill it out ahead of time. If we're not here, we can't speak later or this person got to speak longer than, than I got to speak. I don't know either, you know, take the time limit off and let them speak forever. I don't care, but, you know, just something so I quit getting calls on, you know, why they're not getting <laughs> their three minutes to speak. Um, anybody else have anything? Well, look, I, I had think I can somewhere. address a couple. I think I can address a couple of those as as the sitting chair. Um, it was brought to my attention that the old form on the call to public said that you have to be here at 9:30. If you're here at 9:31, you couldn't sign up. And as the chairman, we, I, I said, I I don't want that. They if they come in here and they travel all this way to speak on a. Uh, on an agenda item that they should be able to, so we've taken care of that. And I couldn't agree with you more about the agenda items. I was surprised last week to get that information, and I said, how come I wasn't notified? Um, I'm, I'm just another supervisor getting this information. And so um, what did we used to We used to do when, Wednesday, the, the cutoff date, and then for special things, like the, 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 it would have to come through the chairman and get permission from the chairman to go on. And I think we need to go back to that. Madam Chairman, um, on, uh, I, I'm, I, I remember uh, that there was a Wednesday cutoff, but I'd like to remind the board that, you know, we have the board meeting on Monday and then the staff has Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday to get things on re-agendized for the next meeting. And that's 10 days in advance and we try to do the best we can. And uh, there's some times that we certainly put a lot of pressure on the clerk of the board. and. Uh, for that, I apologize, but I don't think we've ever waived uh, the situation where the chairman does not have to uh, approve late items. So you would still, if we followed our protocol, the chairman should be approving late items. Is that correct, Jenny? Um, chairman Angus, board members, um, yes, if anything comes after the initial deadline, so we're not talking Thursday deadline at noon, but if something comes the following week, like I sent you an email the other, or a text message the other day with what was coming and Right, but I want to see it, you know, again. I, I want to see what the, the agenda item is and then what's the hold up. I mean, because there are things that we can move to another one because for all the things that Supervisor Johnson said, mm -hmm. it doesn't sometimes give you enough time to really, I was, I was actually texting Mike over on Sunday about some things and taking up his Sunday, but that's what I had to do to, to make sure I understood some stuff. Correct, and then even to touch back on like what Supervisor Johnson brought up just from the regular deadline, I think what we're running into is people are, for lack of a better word, running through the door at five minutes to 12. Well, Ryan hasn't reviewed it. If it needs to go to finance, it hasn't been reviewed. Then it has to go, you know, county manager has to review it. However, what's happening, that's pushing my deadline that further back, so then I'm working over the weekend at this point to get everything that needs to be done. So we need to come up with a better process right. so that everybody who needs to review an item can do so prior to it coming to be placed on an agenda. Do you think you can work with the county manager or whoever you believe to, to Absolutely. get a policy that we can all see in writing? Mm -hmm. and that, That's um, the goal. And actually, Ryan and I have discussed that a little bit already. So, And okay. Madam Chairman, on this uh, particular item, and Supervisor Johnson, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, our rules of order haven't been updated in, in quite some time. And it, uh, I thought it was a good idea when I saw Supervisor Johnson's agenda item to address some other things that have been concerning to the board and one of those other things was what's the board collective's presence preference on uh, uh, bringing things back in front of the board you know so that uh, we can as staff provide suggestions on different 
portions of that rules of order that may need to be updated or may need to better reflect this current board's uh, preferences. Thank right. you. Okay. Does that sound good? Yes, that, and, and Madam Chair, then the, another thing I had, I found my notes finally, um, to make sure that we have, like right now, I think the chairman each time is supposed to pick their own parliamentarian. If we're using uh, Mr. Esplin, then you know, like a call of the public, we need to make sure that things are under our jurisdiction because if people don't understand, they come up and then they're frustrated when they get here because whatever it was wasn't taken care of. And now nobody on the board answers them because it's not <laughs> under our jurisdiction and we can't answer them anyway. I, I think we need to make sure that we're allowing people to talk on issues that we do have, you know, some control over. Um, let's see. Motion to reconsider was one of them that I thought too. Um, I would like on, on the call of the public. Sure, sure. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, on the call of the public, I would like to see the requirement that our our uh, constituents give their name and address at the podium to be um, a little more relaxed. I don't think they need to give their address at the podium. I think it's uh, it's a good idea to have that on the form in case we need to contact them about it. But uh, putting their address out yeah, for for everybody on the internet to see, I, I think is. Yeah. Maybe we could reduce that to just what district they live in or Ryan does that sound legally plausible yeah there's no requirement that the person gives the address at the podium I think they do it for the reasons you just said so we can contact them but there's no absolute requirement that it be in there but that could be part of the process of updating the uh, rules if that's what you want to do you can put that and update the rules of order put as, that in there as far as the call of public and what's in our jurisdiction and you know I, I look at call of public as just addressing you know, your three minutes about pretty much anything. Um, and I always understood that it was at the discretion of the chairman um, whether you can go on or, um, you know, to cut off. But I also rely on both the clerk of the board and our county attorney, and our attorney, our board attorney, to tell me if it's, you know, going off course. You know, so I'm hoping that we could do that a little better as well. Um, and also just to follow up on that, um, on our agenda where the call to the public is noted, the statement under there is actual statute. So the statute actually states within the board's jurisdiction. Right. So anything you read in that, that little blurb there is actual statute. Those aren't our rules, my rules, your rules, that's statute. Right, but, so, but when people come talk, sometimes they don't know what's in our jurisdiction to do. Well, I mean, that's just where- They come with a problem. I, and I understand that, but you know, statute right. states that we right. have to keep them at, at topics within the jurisdiction, which falls to, sorry, Ryan, but the parliamentarian right. to cut them off when it is not. Okay, so if we are all on the same page on that, it's easier said than done, <laughs> okay? The jurisdiction of the board can be very wide. I, I've had this discussion with the Attorney General's office about jurisdiction and whether we, are over, uh, whether we have jurisdiction over something or not. I, I get the position that the board takes. I totally will, and I defend it. It's just easier said than done. Um, there's a wide range of things that the board has jurisdiction over. And so to, to shoehorn that in there, that's a call that sometimes I have to make and sometimes I don't. And I try my best, I try whatever I can to make sure we're on the legal side of things, but it's, it is challenging. I'm sorry, it's, it is a really challenging thing to be able to say what's in their jurisdiction or not. You know, and sometimes when, they, when people come up here and they only have three minutes, you don't realize that until maybe in the second minute. Yeah. And whether they're gonna stop them in their tracks, I mean, I, the way I look at it, they come here, they wanna be heard, and whether or not it's in our jurisdiction, then it could be, we can refer to their supervisor, you know, to see their supervisor and they can explain to them that, you know, what that statute is about. But I, I, I really, as the chairman this time, I don't have any intention on, you know, cutting people off or doing stuff. If they've come here and traveled here, they're gonna get to talk. But it's state law, you have to stop to follow the state law, that's what we have. But does it say, does it say you have to stop them from talking if it's not in the jurisdiction? No, it says yeah, they're only supposed to discuss what's in the right. jurisdiction of the board. And what I'm saying is in my discussions with the AG's office, I can tell you that they, at least I got the impression that they, they take a wide view of that. I mean, this is a debate that I'm, that I've ha that I'm having with the AG's office as we speak. And, uh, and it, it's not easy to, to, to say without giving you a specific example. Unless if somebody came here and said, you know, we want to start farming on the moon. 
Well, clearly that's outside of our jurisdiction. But we're not going to have something like that. But sometimes you get something in there that it seems like, well, that sounds like something the supervisors do, but when in fact they don't, you know? So it's difficult. I will try, try to keep the board on, but you also have, you also have a conflicting constitutional right to speak. When they, they do not, uh, when a person comes in, they do not have a right to speak on any topic. They have a limited, it's a limited public forum. And if we give them that opportunity, then we have to give them that right to speak. Now, going into the content of what people say, that's where the board could run into problems. If you are, if you are saying, well, you can't talk on this topic or this topic, we could run into problems. We just got to keep it within the jurisdiction of the board. That's, that's the key. And, and sometimes that's hard to determine whether it's in the jurisdiction or not. We just, it, it, you always want to steer away from, from censoring content. If you're, if you're ever going to have any kind of constitutional issue, it's any time you're starting to say, well, you can't say this or that. That's where, that's where courts are going to have a heightened scrutiny to say, you know what? If you're telling people what they, say, what they can and cannot say, there's a heightened level of scrutiny, a strict scrutiny standard to determine whether the government can stop that or not. In the, when we're giving somebody a limited public forum, they can speak, but we can have reasonable restrictions on time, manner, and means. That's the, kind of the key, because it's a limited public forum, we can give restrictions on time, manner, and means. And then including that is jurisdiction of, the, of, of this board. It, outside this jurisdiction, yeah, I think we can say, you know what, it's outside of our jurisdiction. The harder question is, what is within this jurisdiction or not? Right. So that's, that's the hard part. And like I said, sometimes within three minutes, that's not easily um, you know, known right off the top of our heads right away sometimes. And if it is, maybe, you know, we're just going to have to play it by ear. Sure. You know, a good example is uh, fire districts. Um, some of it's within our jurisdiction and other discussions are not. And it's hard to tell what's what until the discussion actually ensues. So. Well, I guess the problem I'm having is you, some people are cut off. And some people aren't, and that's the problem. And, and uh, when the clerk's up here, I mean, really, when it gets to the red button, it should stay on until people, you know, it, it's three minutes or it's not. And I think what Ryan is trying to tell us is, at least the word I'll use is if we run it as a business, we wouldn't have had the people from Colorado City talking today. That wasn't a public hearing. And, and we're here to make a decision, and it doesn't require public input on a lot of the work. And, and that's where we get off, because now once you let them talk, how come we don't let somebody talk on another one? I mean, that's, that's what bothers me, because everything should be open. When I first sat on this board, we had no time limits. You could talk all day long if you wanted. We didn't care. You know, we'd shut you down after a while, but we had none of it. I mean, but now we seem to pick and choose who we're going to let talk. And, and I guess the only other thing that bothers me, and I don't know, it'd be a board decision, is the idea that it's in statute that the clerk read that at the end of call to the public, we can, somebody, a board member can refer it to staff, which I think is totally wrong because that item was not agendized for, for discussion. It was not voted on by a majority of the board, but yet somebody is it, it, up here is saying, I want staff to look into it and, and takes up time, whether it might be you know, all five people might, might think it's a great idea or, or the majority of people or all five people or four people might think it's not a great idea. I, I can just see, and I haven't seen it on this board, but I can see where you would have somebody who has a, you know, maybe been indebted against another member or something else that knows they're not going to get two other votes on the board just to have somebody bring it up and then say, I'll have staff look at this because we couldn't turn it down. I don't know if I'm explaining myself right. but. It seems like we're bypassing the will of the board. Well, where does it come uh, on this, this disclaimer itself? At the conclusion, public body and it was, at the conclusion of an open call, public individual members of the public body may respond to criticism, may ask staff to review a matter, or may ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. So that is our policy right now. And that's the law. Statute. That's the law. That's the statute. OK, yeah. so what, you don't want to go by the statute? Well I, well, I think the statute should be changed, but I, I think it... <laughs> I have a few of those I'd like to change That's as well. That's not in our jurisdiction. Not, <laughs> well, I mean, but I think it, it violates the principles, I think, that we're elected for. We're elected as five people to come to a decision, a majority decision on everything. If you do this, I mean, and, I mean, I could have somebody show up as constituent every time and say, I want this done, and I can direct staff, direct staff. I can't direct staff on my own to do something. Uh, but here at a public meeting, without public notice, I'm directing staff to look into something. 
That's the part that bothers me. Okay. Would, would you have, a, if I may, would you have a problem if, if somebody says, hey, I want, I want an issue to be addressed and I want staff to know it, to have the board vote to whether to refer it to staff? I said, I wouldn't bother me. Uh, that's true. You're right. It's not agendized to vote. Yeah. So that's a problem. I mean, yeah. it is. It's, it's a challenge. I, I see that. Thank you. It, it was just yeah. a personal thing because people have the ability to come and see any one of the supervisors get something on the agenda. And if somebody called the public comes forward and says, you know, the roads here are washed out and nobody's doing anything, any one of us can go and say, hey, put that on the next agenda to do it. It just seems like you're bypassing. If I had somebody do it, I'm bypassing the four of you. I'm getting work done without you know, this goes back to 2013 when the new board came on and, and we changed the policies. There was no call to public in 2000, you know, before 2013. I think there was many, many years ago and then they stopped. And um, what, what that board said at the time was, you know, we believe that everybody has the right to address their elected body in public on the record. That's the difference than just going to your office or emailing us. Um, everybody has that right. That was what that board believed at the time, and that's why we voted for a call to public. So if you're going to have the call to public, if you make all these other restrictions on it, then, you know, again, why do it? I know you would rather not do it, but um, I, I like that 2013 policy that we instated. Anything? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ryan, is that a shall or a may? It's when a, we I'm talk about directing staff to take action it's a may so it's discretionary so I'm looking at it um, and that's the yeah, statute it's a verbatim yeah it is it is What's on the agenda? It's yeah. all those are may so may respond to criticism may ask staff to review may ask that it be put on a matter in a future agenda and what I wonder if they're actually talking about an individual or the collective body, though, in the directing staff to take action? I don't know. That's a good question. And, but, you know, as the clerk pointed out, it's not been agendized to vote on. Right. So it's clearly Well, if it's a, not agendized to vote on, why, how can it have action taken upon that's it? That's always been my question. Because it was this, the reason that you agendize things is so the public knows what we're doing. If we order somebody to do something, the public has no knowledge we were going to order somebody to do something. It's individual members of the public body. Yeah, it says so individual members. Each one of them. Yeah. Well, maybe we can get some yeah. clarity on that statute. I'll look into it more. I'll look at the legislative history. See, but I, and I think uh, Supervisor Bishop just pointed out, individual members of the public body may respond to criticism. Does that individual member, does it carry to each clause in the sentence? I have to go through my English, you know, my, 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 <laughs> my English learning to determine whether it would follow that same clause. And what I was told all the time, and this, I think the way we've always done it, at least since I was here, is that it's the discretion of the chairman, whether the person speaking can keep, continue speaking or, or not. And, and if that is something that um, is, not, is against statute, um, or if that's a new, some policy you want to put in, I, I don't think you'd want to, but that's just the way I feel about it. Well, we can do any kind of research that the board wishes for us to do. Oops, I did that all without my microphone on. Okay, um, so is there any action on this, Supervisor Johnson? Uh, it's, uh, 40. 39. It's item. All right, uh, direct, I make a motion to direct staff to review and update within 60 days for direction from the board, the Mojave County Rules of Order and Agenda Submission Procedures and include the clerk of the board in on that when the staff review. Second. Okay, motion second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, motion carries. Uh, item 40, discussion and possible action, discuss the board's interest in extending the quarter cent sales tax for one year period to be used exclusively for building a regional sheriff's substation and county morgue and direct staff accordingly. Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I brought this back because I did want to move ahead or, or kill it one or the other. I just want to see if there's any interest in doing it. Um, if not, then we'll just stop it today. Um, so I thought I'd get a feel from the board if it was worth, worth the time of putting something together. Okay, you, you want to start with how you feel? Oh, I, I put it on. You so put I it on? Okay. I think it's a, 
I, I think we've cut it down to just the two because we don't have enough money coming in from the one-year extension that will be there before we're before our time has expired. That's why it's just down to the two. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chairman, I have a question for Supervisor Johnson. Uh, I got an email and a text from some folks that were concerned about the project at Sterling and how that might affect the location at Franconia. Did you get the same information? Yes, I believe I did get it. Uh, I don't know how that would affect anything with, with down there. We're putting it on the highway. Franconia is a mile exit above the Havasu exit, and Sterling is, is down south of the Havasu exit, so it's, it's quite a ways <laughs> from it. All right. I didn't, I didn't see it as a problem either, but I just wanted yeah. to make sure everybody <laughs> got the information. Um, if you've made a motion. No, we're just going around and discuss, you, you just want this kind I just of want discussion. to get an idea if it was worth the time to expend them, yeah, if people were interested or not. I'd certainly be supportive. Okay. Supervisor Gould? Uh, I'm not interested in extending the sales tax. Oh, there you go. I, we don't care uh, what Supervisor Bishop and <laughs> yeah, well, it's <laughs> over. And, and Angus say then. And, and let me give you my reasoning that um, 20 years ago when this was put on, it was put on for a particular length of time. The public has very little faith in politicians. I don't know if you guys have probably noticed this, and I've noticed it also. Um, when you levy a tax and you tell people it's going to end, it needs to end. And if we want to continue, then you might want to put it back on the ballot and see if the voters are willing to tax themselves to do this. But to tell them, we told you it was going to be 20 years, but we decided, hey, let's go 22. You know, or I, I just think that's disingenuous, and I'm not interested in doing that. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to speak. So, Supervisor Bishop, do you want to say anything? No, it sounds like it's a dead deal unless we want to entertain a new quarter cent sales tax. Okay. That's it. Okay. What, what I wanted to say, what I was going to say um, before this became dead in the water, was that until we get more information about everything, I would, I, I would not commit to it. Because um, my feeling and my opinion is that um, I would rather, I wouldn't vote for a morgue before animal shelter. I think we need an animal shelter more than a morgue. And um, I asked uh, staff for information about uh, the morgue. And as far as I can tell, the numbers have kind of gone down a bit. There's been no complaints. And before we start building buildings, hiring staff, buying equipment, everything that goes along with bringing this, this division into county that's growing government, we've got to be very careful uh, about that. And, and I see a, a problem with that. So I would be noncommittal at this point. So I just wanted to get that on the record as well. I guess, Madam Chair, just to, just to clarify for um, Supervisor Gould, um, I was one of the people who put this in for 20 years. I've already sunsetted one, one uh, override that was out there. And the only reason I was considering it is because it can be done at a one-year deal. Once this, is, once this is up, I think the, probably the shortest you can do is 10 years. Now you've got to spend... $70 million or $80 million, where you could just spend the $6 million and get the buildings that, if these are buildings that we wanted, we could get those buildings. But if we, once we pass this, because the state doesn't like you putting a tax, I don't even think it'll let you put a tax in for a year or five years. I think it's going to be a 10 year minimum now, if I'm correct. I think finance might be able to tell me. Is it a 10 year minimum on a sales tax? Sir, I don't think that there is a minimum. Well, I know before they said they weren't going to allow us to put in, you know, one year or two year. Because every, everybody in this, you know, air conditioner guys, everybody else has to change their sales tax for a short period. That, that was the reason I, the only reason I did the extension. Okay, so just for clar clarification, this wouldn't be an extension of the tax, the sales, course and sales tax for buildings and capital improvement. This would be a brand new tax. We would be sunsetting that quarter cent and bringing on a, a new tax. No, it would be just an extension. Just an extension, one year. Okay. Just to, just to raise the funds, which quarter, about, what, $6.5 million for, for one it's, year? Uh, Madam Chairman, I believe it's, uh, it's uh, over $7 million is what we would gain in a year. But I did want to make one clarification um, that uh, this particular tax uh, that, we're contem that the board's contemplating uh, or discussing today, it, it can't be enacted by the vote of the people. It can only be enacted by the Board of Supervisors, and the Board of Supervisors can't give away that authority that's get granted to them by statute. Now, there's other taxes that can be enacted through uh, 
approval of the board to go to a vote, but not this particular tax. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think it's just no action taken on this. Okay. Item 41, discussion possible action. Um, to consult with and receive legal advice from the public body's attorney concerning the complete investigation. I, I believe that we are continuing this till um, next meeting. Okay. Do I need a motion? Dumb it. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> yeah. I'll second. Yeah, we did. I'm going to vote also. <laughs> Okay, um, next one is brought by Supervisor Gould. Discussion possible action, approved turnkey installation of four strand smooth wire right of way fence at 10,200 by American Fence Company, sourced to Arizona State Cooperative contract along the north and south right of way boundary of an approximately, um, did, I, did I, excuse me, I think I missed something important, let me just, Oh, okay. So since 36, we had some, I'm sorry, we had someone signed up for 36, but I, I think he was in favor. So I'm sorry about that if you're still here. Okay, back to this one. Um, 1,000 foot section of Fathom Drive west of London Bridge Road in the Crystal Beach area for sole purpose of preventing recreational vehicle access, ingress and egress movements, and roadside activity associated with significant continuous overnight camping activity by transient Vince visitors through the winter months with funding source to FY19 adopted budget under fund 205-41370. Uh, highway user revenue fund, road repair man materials, and further approve accepting Arizona State Land Department donation of up to 2,000 feet of fencing for county exclusive use to repair existing or to install fence extension in interest of controlling recreational vehicle encroachment and parking on state lands in the greater Crystal Beach area. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Supervisors, we have a problem in this area. Th this area is on Lennon Bridge Road and Fathom Road, which is the road that goes to the Crystal Beach area in um, the no north of Lake Havasu. It's behind the shopping mall. Um, when I, after I won the Republican primary, I was invited to go to a neighborhood meeting where this was an issue, had been an issue in the previous year, and that they have campers camping on uh, state trust land. And the rules for state trust land require that you be a quarter of a mile off of a road. And these folks are essentially pulling off the shoulder of the road and beginning to camp there. Um, county ordinance also limits them to 14 days of camping. Most of these people have been there for the entire season, for the winter season. Uh, I've seen photographs of uh, um, set or holding tank waste being drained on the ground. Um, there, I'm not at the high point. There was probably close to 200 people camping in this area. So we took it up with the state land department. With the state land department, since they have no rangers, and the only law enforcement is the county sheriff's department, our, is, everybody knows how strained our deputies are, and that they didn't really sign up to be park rangers. Um, the solution that state land came up with was that they would donate the material to fence a thousand foot section off of this road, which between there's a mesa and a wash, and that'll effectively, if those people choose to camp in the area, they will then have to be further from the road. Um, it takes the burden off of the sheriff's department to have to police the area. Um, it takes advantage of the the donation of the material from the state land department. And that's the only option that state land gave us. They didn't, I had a constituent call and said, Gould, why don't you big, dig a big ditch? And um, I said that big ditch would work, but that was, that's not our land. It belongs to the state land department. And they did not give digging a big ditch as an option to me. They gave me the option of fencing. Um, in discussions with Mr. Latosky, we thought it was better to um, take the material donation from the state land department but and use that for other repairs but have the contractor provide his own material in his contract so that we don't come up with a conflict which happens sometimes with contractors when they aren't the ones that provide the material that it's your crummy material that created this problem um, that w if they're providing both labor and material they will not have that excuse so they'll have to you know make sure that they do a good job and it'll all be on them and they can't push it off on anybody else but Mr. Lutoski, I believe, has a presentation and some photographs also. Okay.
Uh, Chairman Angus, uh, members of the board, uh, I believe the uh, backup uh, more or less encapsulates, and uh, Supervisor Gould did a very good job uh, uh, presenting the uh, issue at hand. Uh, essentially, coming off of uh, London Bridge Road, it's a relatively rolling train in that area, so access uh, for RVs uh, off of London Bridge Road uh, <coughs> doesn't exist in many areas. Uh, there's a, a couple of uh, real isolated spots where we've seen RVs pull off. I personally was there on uh, Sunday, uh, uh, February 24th uh, to observe uh, very much as uh, Supervisor Gould described a plethora of recreational vehicle parking uh, off of the uh, county right-of-way uh, just off the county right-of-way on state lands. Uh, this does create um, uh, some uh, issues with uh, traffic safety and uh, uh, circulation uh, namely uh, uh, just the lack of uh, general access uh, uh, visible access uh, from uh, uh, Fathom Drive uh, onto uh, these uh, areas where the RVs park. Essentially, they can pull on and off wherever they uh, see fit. And uh, as the supervisor mentioned, uh, this is existing approximately 1,000 feet west from the uh, London Bridge Road where uh, uh, Fathom Drive then uh, um, uh, there's a significant elevation difference, uh, a lowering uh, into the uh, Greater Crystal Beach area. So that uh, those areas aren't, aren't uh, seeing any uh, camping activity. Uh, so as a result, um, we uh, did work uh, through procurement and uh, we have a uh, cooperative procurement contract with a fencing company that uh, represented a cost of $5.10 a linear foot. Uh, we'd be uh, obviously looking at both sides of the right of way in this instance, so 2,000 feet total. Uh, the contractor only subtracted their bid uh, a dollar eight cents per linear foot for to remove the fencing. So we see it as a, a practical, for practical purposes, uh, engaging the contractor uh, with the support of the board to uh, uh, install uh, both uh, uh, the contractor provided fence and utilize, as the supervisor pointed out, out the uh, state lands fencing uh, for future repairs as necessary. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Ms. Slotowski? Yes, I have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> How big a piece of land does state land have out there? Um, Supervisor Johnson, I do not have that information. Uh, it's over 1,000 acres they have there. Okay. So you're looking at putting a 1,000 foot of fence down both sides of the road and think that's going to stop the problem. The problem I have is it, it, I just drove it today coming into work. We went down there to look and there's a lot of exits off of London Bridge Road, which is obviously a main road for us. Um, we're coming to the end of the snowbird season and there are a lot of vehicles out there state land said that they're willing to work with us to see about making it you know no camping or you know no trespassing on their land um, I, I think that the I mean it's not much money ten thousand dollars but I don't think it's gonna stop the problem and if we have a problem if their laws the sheriff can enforce the laws if they're within a quarter mile of the road they can go out and sight them and tow them away it only takes one person to be towed away where they all stop but i'd rather see us do it that way instead of putting ten thousand dollars into something i don't think it's going to handle anything we've got snowbird seasons ending state land said they'll look at it they've got problems in yuma and other places too they need to look at to make them off limits and that way nobody could go on it if that would help supervisor Gould. i have a, a, just a comment on something that you said is the sheriff here or someone from the sheriff's department here? Because I was told that um, the sheriff has stated that they have no jurisdiction on that land, that, that that's what they state. Um, so that's one of the, probably one of the barriers for why things haven't been taken care of. But if we do have it for how long, how much did you say of the off quarter mile? Quarter mile? Then um, you know maybe some, something that the sheriff's office should look into. Yeah, what, what's the short answer to that, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Chief Deputy Dean McKee with the sheriff's office. Um, the sheriff is not uh, here today. Um, we got an opinion from uh, from Ryan, and uh, if they had a permit, it was our understanding that we were not able to cite them. Right, and I think that's, that was part of the confusion of what they had because you can get, I think it's a yearly permit from the state for 45 Four, bucks. To 14 stay 15 days. 15 days anywhere. Well, you don't pay more than 15 days. So it would be impossible for them to understand if the guy's been there, even if he had pictures. But if he is a quarter mile in, 
Let me hook his ass up and tore him away. But what if, what if they were doing something illegal within that quarter mile, or there was an altercation or something? Would the sheriff's office respond? Oh, absolutely. We do respond to those calls um, down in that area, and we have been down there. Um, our posse volunteers have patrolled the area. Um, they've checked permits. Um, it's, you know, we're caught in a very difficult position. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of people signed up to speak. Bill Gardner. Hello, Madam Chairman and members of the board. My name's Bill Gardner. I live at 1004 Vista Drive. That's in Crystal Beach. This has been an issue for only the last two years or last year. If you want to see a picture of the area from 2017, that's that picture right there. I don't know if you can see it. I don't see a picture. Oh, there it is. There's no trails. There's no nothing. The campers, if you do get a permit, you are not supposed to go over berms. You are not supposed to go into unblazed areas. You're not supposed to go into places where they're not already been camping. This is a picture from December 28th, 2018, from the air. A friend of mine took it. You can see the trails. You can see it going around. They're not supposed to be there. This is how close they are to the road. Rotate it. This is how close they are to the road. That's London Bridge Road right there. This is after you go around the corner. Other way. This is after you go around the corner. They're still right there. That's 50 feet from the paved surface. They're not supposed to be within a paved surface, quarter mile. Madam Chairman, the sign that was shown in that photo is a no trespassing sign also. That is a no trespassing sign. That means they can camp there if they have a, fort, a permit, and it's for 14 days annually, period. They're not allowed any more, any more than that. This, again, is a road that they provided, they made, and this is probably well over 100 of them in there. I personally have pictures of ones that have been out there since November, and they're still there. They have huge water tanks. They string their clothes out and wash their clothes. They have an RV that has a 100-gallon propane tank. They're not there for 14 days. They're there well beyond that. The trash that they bring out there, the trash that they leave there, you're supposed to have, if you're camping, you're supposed to have toilets, stuff for holding tanks and stuff. He's going to have a holding tank? He's going to go to the bathroom? <coughs> I personally have driven by out there and seen people pulling their pants up after defecating or urinating in the area. This is what they leave behind. That's only part of it. They have burned things out there. They make their little campfires. They burn their aluminum. They burn cans, bottles. There's broken glass all over the place out there. And then they just leave things. They just leave their stuff behind. The sheriff's office does have jurisdiction out there. The sheriff's office is the enforcement office out there. They are the ones that take care of it. They can fine every day, 24 hours. Every 24 hours, if the person doesn't leave or doesn't go about their business, Buster Johnson, if you tell one of them, monkey see, monkey do, they're all going to scatter. Okay? It's pretty, it's pretty clear and obvious not to mention the RVs that circle around in the neighborhood, looking for a place to, to camp in our residence. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Where did I put them? Um, I've kind of lost my, my things here. You come on up and state your name, please, because so, I can't find it right now. Oh, I have them right here. You're Barbara? Yes. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm a little nervous, so bear with me. Don't be nervous. Um, I do know one person on your um, panel. 
Mr. Gold, he's been to my home. Uh, the meeting he spoke of was held at my residence. I live on Edgewater, which is the very last street right at the edge of the river in Crystal Beach. We get a lot of them circulating through the neighborhood. Um, they, I have, I know Bill showed you a bunch of pictures. I have more pictures to add. This is, if you can see it, I'll, this is a panoramic wow. of the area. I don't know if you can see that very well. That is taken standing on Fathom, looking out down um, London Bridge Road towards town, and then looking back into our neighborhood down Fathom. So if that gives you an indication as to, whoops, I'm breaking things. If that gives you an indication as to how many campers have been out there in our neighborhood. Uh, um, I would suspect that at one time there were probably more of them than there are of us that live in our neighborhood. Um, they go through the neighborhood. I know I only have three minutes, so I'm trying to get through this quickly. This, this picture shows them unloading their Jeeps, their off-road vehicles. And this is a guy that has left our neighborhood, has circled our neighborhood, gone up over private property everywhere else, and then he has camped in this campground. There is many of them that I can show you that I have taken of these people that have driven through our neighborhood. There's more. There's some of the trash, the trash, the trash. Driving through the neighborhood, more trash. They park on the side of the road. That's what this bottom one shows. Um, this gentleman here was right on the corner of our street. And I asked him what he was doing in the neighborhood. And he said he was looking for a place to camp. I said, really? I said, do you understand that you're standing on private property and you are in a residential, not commercial neighborhood? We are agricultural and residential out there. Uh, many of us have horses, um, goats, chickens, pigs, the list goes on. These are pictures of some of the motorhomes driving through the neighborhood. The, this group of um, motorcyclists were from the camp up on the hill on Fathom. They were driving through pro private property. This particular piece of property here, the gentleman tried to put what we call coffin blocks out there to try and slow up the traffic of the people that are coming from that campsite into our neighborhood. This guy moved from one side of the road to the other side of the road, back to the other side of the road in order to try and do whatever he was doing with permits. This person is running a business um, he was taking his blue van to the swap meet and selling whatever products that he was making on the property of the state trust land. This is another picture of the laundry. I know he already showed you the laundry. But this is the guy out there, and you can see the logo on his vans that he was driving back and forth to the swap meet from the particular pieces of property of the state property. Not only do we get that, but we get abandonments. We have people out there begging for money. Um, we have, um, there's an RV sitting out there right now that has been abandoned. Not only do we have to put up with all of this and the destruction of our roads, but them driving through our neighborhood, um, scaring our animals. Um, I do have a couple of questions. You talked about the fence and whether or not the fence would be a good idea or not a good idea. Um, I was wondering if the residents of Crystal Beach could have an input on where that fence went so it would be strategically maximizing the uh, utilization of the amount of fencing that you might allocate for that particular area. Um, would signs be a better solution? I do like the fence because they, the, it does say no trespassing, but it also says if you have the state um, permit for 14 days, um, but it's annually. And I think where that's a misconception, that's why they're moving from one place to another. Um, and Yuma's got up for grabs about a two mile radius. I mean, honestly, uh, some help. Thank, I don't thank know. you. I don't thank, know. Thank you, and thank you for the pictures. 
Barbara, Sh oh, we got those. Barbara Schaefer, Curtis Schaefer, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, and um, lastly, we have Jean Kench. Thank you for having me. I'm Jeannie Kench, uh, board members, chairman, thank you. I want to thank uh, Ron Gold for going through the trouble of getting together with the State Department, trying to do something about this really horrible situation. The, the, the community has to drive through all of this every day, twice a day, or however many times a day they leave their home. Um, I wanted to bring to, uh, to note um, a policy, an ordinance that the county had adopted in 99, 99-07, where it says, that the Board of Supervisors of Mojave County, the board has determined that uncontrolled and unregulated camping on public and private property has created certain health hazards and has contributed to unsightly and unsanitary <coughs> conditions throughout the county. And whereas the board has further determined that it would be in the public interest of the residents of county for the board to regulate camping on public and private property to control and mitigate damage to the public health environment and aesthetics of the area. This is already an ordinance. Our, sh our sheriff did decide not to regulate, but my concern is, is that this is what we're having if we don't regulate. And I understand that we have a, a limited staff members to regulate it, but we can go over and above this. We can say no camping within two miles or one mile of our residents or businesses. The businesses are losing if they are an RV park and the residents are losing because we have to go pick up that trash now. And everyone's expecting us to go do it, as well as the fact you're in rains, we have to smell them. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was pretty bad this year uh, because people aren't using proper uh, containments for their excretions. Um, so I would hope that if we don't do the fence, that we go forward with trying to get an ordinance that doesn't allow this. This is also happening on the south end of town, but the people on the south end of town don't have to drive through them to get home like we do. And it could happen anywhere. I understand we are a, um, a, 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 a community and we should be and be proud of the community of the tourists that come here, but there's plenty of space out there for them to use. They're up off 95, they're using the BLM area, which they do get 14 days, move their tires, another 14 days, move their tires, another 14 days, and it's full and it doesn't bother anyone or concern any community. But this could literally affect our property values because if we can't sell homes, then our market goes down. And I don't want to see that happen as the assessor either. Is there any questions I can answer for you? Anyone? No, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I just want to mention I did receive, we all received a letter um, from the former fire chief of Desert Hills Fire Department who is saying the same sorts of things. Um, yes, sir? I'm sorry, Madam Chairman. I have the sheriff on the phone. He'd like to uh, are, on speakerphone. Are you, uh, what, who, Matt Espinoza? Sheriff. Oh, the sheriff. No, I, I, before you do that, let me, let me just finish this. Um, and I, I'm just going to read a little of it because he, he reassess, he reinstates a lot of what was said already, but he said um, that he's been approached by many people who are concerned about the increasing amount of RVs camping, and it's important to note that the objection of the presence of RVs outside of established parks are multifaceted. Some people have stated that campers and heavy RVs have been blazing new roads across the desert. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the past couple of years since campers have discovered the area, new roads have been blazed across virgin desert. Their vehicles carve a much more significant path than other traditional off-road vehicles. And then he goes on with some of the same things, the 14-day maximum stay, and he'd like to see the no camping signs to the existing permission-only access signs. This would keep these areas open to the public access for hiking, exploring, off-roading, and other uses. And he'd like to recommend that the Mojave County Board of Supervisors petition the Arizona State Land Department to implement camping restrictions to the existing signage along Fathom Drive and London Bridge Road in the Crystal Beach and Desert Hills area. So I'm gonna put this into the record. And thank you, Mr. Espinoza. Are you there, Sheriff? I'm here. Okay, I'm gonna see if I, hopefully I don't get much feedback on this. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chairman, members of the board, can you hear me? Yes. Very good, I'll be brief. I know you've had a long morning already. I just wanted to chime in on this situation, uh, just clarify a couple of issues. Uh, first and foremost, I recognize uh, the importance of addressing this issue. I, I personally do not like the fact that they're camping that close to the city limits, whether it's Lake Havis or any other incorporated city. However, we are bound by law. And I want to make this very clear. 
We do enforcement in that area on all illegal activity. The problem that we've run into and the reason we cannot issue citations for people camping on state trust land is because the state trust rules do not state that it's a quarter mile from any road or residence. That refers to recreational users, not camping. So I've been in touch with the state trust board. I appreciate all the work that uh, Supervisor Gould has been to this. Uh, it, it's the privy of the board if they feel offense is appropriate, but I think it can be handled by putting appropriate signage out there to basically move them farther out of the, uh, the city limit area. I don't think they need to be that close to any part of the incorporated areas of our cities. And I think that can be accomplished. Do you have any no, comments on that? I have a question. Can you clarify what, you, what he said by there's no law about being a quarter mile? Are you able to clarify where you heard uh, the uh, quarter mile? I actually uh, was looking at the permit process, uh, Supervisor Johnson, uh, and it does uh, it does say that motorized uh, recreational vehicles shall not be operated within a quarter mile, but it does, the camping ordinance says you shall not camp within a quarter mile of a water tank or animal. Uh, so. I don't know, you know, I can't, I don't know what the definition of motorized recreational vehicle is, but it says being operated, not camping. If that answers your question. I could be operated to get there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Samantha. Okay, thank you. Do you have anything else, Sheriff? No, that's a valid point. Again, the, the bottom line is we wish to address the issue. Uh, we recognize that uh, it is problematic, and I think it can be done in, at a low, a very low level working with the state. We're coming to the end of this season anyhow, so it's something that needs to be addressed. I know Yuma County has been dealing with these same exact issues, and they're working with state trust land. So uh, we're going to support whatever we need to do to move it out of that area. But, again, I, I want to be very clear. Uh, we do take action on all violations. If there's litter, we enforce it. But uh, as Supervisor Gould mentioned, we don't have the staffing to play park rangers. We can't be out there every day checking permits. It's just uh, time prohibited. So we would uh, definitely support any change. and We're willing to work with State Trust Land to, to make that happen. Okay. Anyone have a question for the sheriff? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sheriff Schuster. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Yes, please. You can see from the complexity of this issue why the, really the only thing that we can do at this point is put that fence up that will keep people from most of the people that are close to the road go past the area that will, would be fenced. It would not eliminate the people from the whole, there's, I believe there's two sections of state land there on each side of Fathom Road. It would get them back far enough so that they're not right on the side of the road as you saw in the pictures. And this was the... Uh, uh, solution that was acceptable to state land, it's state land's land. Um, you're not going to, uh, the legislature's not going to act, if, let's say the legislature decides to act, they won't act until next year, which means the effective date of anything that they do will be sometime uh, uh, the following summer from now. So what do you do in the meantime? You're going to have the same situation next winter. Um, state land also requested that we did not fence that up until after the snowbirds left so that we'd not be fencing them in. We want to fence them out. Um, to me, this is the only solution, action that we can take at this point that's going to, the, if the statute's unclear whether you're operating a motorized off-road vehicle within a quarter of a mile of a, of a road, um, those are motorized vehicles that are off-road. And they're being, they, some, they had to operate to get there. So the, the thing, like most things that come out of the legislature, they're not, they're as clear as mud sometimes. But um, I would go ahead and fence it. I, I'm still supportive of the fencing because that's the only solution that's gonna have an effect in the near future. Okay. And hopefully members can support me with that. Okay. Madam Chair, I think the state land director has the ability to put, to change it to no trespassing order take it off where the public can't go on it. I don't think the legislature has to do that. I think they can do it. So if we were to have meetings with them, especially like you said, and I've heard the same thing, having problems in Yuma and other areas where they might have to start restricting use of state land, I, I just don't think the, you know, especially I didn't know we're gonna, now we're going to wait till after the snowbirds leave so don't fence them in, but they'll always find a way in with just that 1,000 foot of thousands and thousands of <laughs> feet that are out there needed. 
If you look at the terrain, though, that, that's really the only part that's accessible from Fathom Road, because there's a big bluff on one side and a wash on the other side. Is, there, is this something that you know, we can do that's a good that fencing is the start, but can you work with the state lands and, sure. and see if they put the, the, fen, the um, signage up? And, um, if the, yeah, that's not a problem that. working with them, but I'm looking for a solution. Okay. I get calls on this daily. You yeah, know, no. yeah, so I want to get something going. Okay. And it only, it, you know, and I didn't really realize how many people were out there when we, have, we had a meeting in, gosh, September, and I'm just hearing about this, and, I, and rea I kept going back and looking, and I go, man, these folks are blowing this out of proportion. And then the, about Christmas time, boom, boom there, was just, there was just 100, 200 people out there. It was just ridiculous. I, I just have one more question. You say you want to wait till snow. I mean, is there a time when there's nobody there? Oh, there is. Okay. In about a month. Yeah. Okay. Do <laughs> okay. you want to make a motion? Sure. Um, I move that item 42 be adopted. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, four to one. Our next up is from Tammy Ersenbach, our Economic Development Director. Agenda item 43, approve the adoption of a resolution supporting the designation of the, where, the Western Arizona Economic Development District as an Economic Development District and authorizing the Chairman to sign a letter to Governor Doug Ducey requesting his support in the creation of it. Madam Chair, we have all the backup and make a motion to approve. Well, um, I, I'd like to discuss. I have some questions, okay. actually. Um, and does anybody else have any questions before I go? I was going to second the motion. But. Oh, okay. All right. I know everybody wants to get out of here, but I, I do have a, a couple of questions. Um, so my, my concern about this is that, you know, all the things that um, you say this is going to do, um, it, it's, it looks like... Um, other entities are going to be competing with this bigger district. And I don't see how, you know, if, if, if Yuma gets grants, how that really helps us. You're saying this, this is a whole thing together. So, so their workforce, you know, stuff helps us. And, and then I was looking at um, the grants that have been, have already gone through this district. And one was for the Kingman Airport. And one was a grant for the Lake Havasu City Airport. So this district will be competing with other entities within Mojave County. So, yes and no. What they're doing is trying to create, the, when they apply for the grants, the grants hopefully will be regional that we can actually use for all of the, the three counties, which would be the Yuma, La Paz, and Mojave County. So the idea is in creating, it was a temporary agency already with the Economic Development um, Administration. And so what they're doing is trying to finalize it and make it a permanent agency for them to apply for the grants as well as additional grants we haven't been able to apply for. So in that process, um, some of the grants that they apply for now hopefully are going to be regional grants that we can all use, all three counties can use. An example is that they want to apply for, a, it's actually a loan, but it's a revolving loan fund that they can apply for that any one small business within that region will be able to apply for. They're, um, in other areas, they've been able to apply for uh, research grants that would help economic development and workforce um, service programs and additional infrastructure that would go from one county to the next. So now we're taking it from a very small agency and expanding that so that it'll help the whole region. Um, what is the, it's been in temporary um, form right now, but mm -hmm. w what has been the breakdown of grants to each county? I don't have that information, I'm sorry. So that's I can, a little, I can a little get concerning that, to me. Yeah, um, I can get that from Alan Pruitt, but he is in Yuma County today doing the same he's thing. In, so, and who makes the final decision on where, who gets the, these grants or? Each county in the past has been going through this agency and the agency has submitted it to the Economic Development Administration. But, um, and it's up to our counties to do that, but we have to have their support, this agency's support to even get the grants. So any EDA grant specific, we've got to have their so stamp of approval there, there on it. So there are certain grants that have to go through an entity like this, like WACOG has to go through a COG. Mm -hmm. um, yes. it, it's not something that Mojave County can go for on their own? We, we can go through it on our own, but we have to have their stamp of approval or their letter of support to be able to get these grants. Oh, brother. <laughs> okay, that uh, makes me understand it a little bit more. Okay, unfortunately. Okay, so I 
Madam Anyone Chairman, uh, you might want to ask what the cost, uh, estimated cost for this would be. Oh, yeah, that would be interesting. So currently there is no estimated cost. They will come back later, I'm sure, and ask. It's going to be four cents per population of our census of 2007, uh, 2010. But at this point, which would be about $8,000, but at this point we're not asking for any money. So that, but once but that we're would, in it, are we committed to that money? So right at this point, we're just creating the organization. So that's a step one. Step two is they'll come and ask for somebody in our county to sit on their board. Um, and then step three is down the road, if the Board of Supervisors want and approve, then they would ask for funding at that point. But at this point, it's just to get this organization organized, reorganized, and as a permanent, permanent organization. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Okay, motion. That's good. Oh, we do. Okay. I have to pay more attention. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We've already taken care of item 44, so I'll have a motion to adjourn. I'll move. Second. We're adjourned.